Today marks the third month of my pregnancy. I've been in and out of the hospital for the past few months and am suffering from a deep, lingering depression. It all started when I climbed Mount San Cristobal. Let's put the Devil's Mountain to the test on this hike, Kyle said. He was president of our hiking club. We met on a mountain and fell in love on a mountain, not knowing it would all end on a mountain. On this hike, we were joined by our close friend, Alan. He was a cheeky fellow who enjoyed playing practical jokes on us. However, he was warned not to do so on this expedition. Mount San Cristobal is a potentially active volcano located between the provinces of Laguna and Quezon on Luzon Island and is located beside Mount Banahao, otherwise known as the Sacred Mountain by locals. There have been myths concerning both mountains. One is a source of terror, while the other is a path to salvation. Our van was stopped for inspection. A police officer greeted us with an ominous warning. Mount Cristobal is called the Devil's Mountain for a reason. If I were you, I wouldn't proceed on this journey. He held his hand out to feel the rain. See? It's raining even though the sun is shining. Believe me, I have seen this all before. Alan proceeded to laugh. The officer was visibly irritated. So he explained that three tourists had gone missing while hiking in the mountain just last week. He looked at our travel documents, then returned them. Then whispered to us, If you get lost, Turn your shirts inside out. The hike hadn't fully started yet, when peculiar things occurred. Hmm? Kyle found a big hairy caterpillar inside his bag when he was getting bug spray. He suspected that Alan put it there, so he reminded him not to joke around. Alan just shrugged <sighs> his shoulders in confusion. As we hiked up the trail, the rainforest on Mount San Cristobal sent chills down my spine, with its moss-covered ancient trees and gloomy fog. We stumbled across a terrifying sign hanging on a baleti tree that warned us the region was haunted by spirits, and that we must be respectful. <laughs> Alan laughed. He was sure that it had been placed there by locals to frighten visitors and make the mountain more eerie. However, he stopped laughing when he felt something on his neck. I looked at his neck and found several black and brown leeches. These are blood-sucking limatic, he said as he tried to remove and stomp on them. I was concerned about his neck. Some areas appeared bruised. I caught Kyle looking at me as I was applying cream on Alan's neck. I sensed he was becoming jealous, so I teasingly proceeded to lightly stroke our friend's neck. After a few hours, we decided to rest and have dinner. Alan forgot the discomfort and set up his hammock. I went near Kyle as he was setting up our tent. I embraced him from behind, but he immediately turned away. This led Alan to tease us with a song. He suddenly stopped singing when some stones were thrown near our tent. Alan was suspicious. Maybe some locals were playing tricks on us. Kyle tried to find the source of the stones, but didn't find anything. It was dark, so we relied on the campfire. We cooked some food and ate while Alan hung out in his hammock. He wasn't interested in dinner because of the pain in his neck. I stopped chewing when more stones were thrown at us. Kyle instantly glanced around. Alan was still in his hammock, asleep, so it wasn't him. Then beyond the baleti trees, I spotted a weird shadow. I tried to point it out, but it quickly vanished. Kyle pulled out his Swiss army knife and walked over to the trees. 
nothing was there. However, I noticed the shadow again. It moved quickly from one tree to the next, along with the sound of thunderous thumps. The noise woke up Alan, and he pulled out his knife. We decided to leave the area. We were certain someone was hiding in the trees, and I felt like someone was following us since I could still hear faint thuds nearby. After wandering around for a while, we came upon an abandoned hut and went inside. The floor was made of bamboo sticks that squeaked whenever we stepped on it. The leaves on the roof were already loose, allowing us to see the full moon through them. We decided to sleep there for the night. As I was laying down, I saw the shadow again and realized it seemed human, but not quite at the same time. Kyle and Alan didn't see the shadow, but heard the heavy thumps. So we left the hut and looked for help. We traveled for almost an hour and didn't encounter anyone. All we could hear was the sound of crickets, along with the heavy thuds following us. We then arrived at the same abandoned hut and realized we were lost and going around in circles. I remembered what the police officer told us, so I turned my shirt inside out. After I finished, I assisted Kyle. When I turned to Alan, he declined. Alan was breathing heavily. He dropped to his knees, exhausted. Go ahead, I'll catch up later. We should stop here and let Alan rest. No, let him rest here. We'll get help once we reach the base. Go on, I'll be fine. I just need a few minutes. With a sigh of relief, we could now see the nearest town in the distance. And noticed something staring at us. Sure enough, there it was. Sitting beneath a huge baletti tree. A giant, human-like figure with the head of a horse. Its eyes were burning with rage as it stood on its hind legs. It had two abnormally long arms and two long slender legs. Surrounding its body was dark smoke that smelled like sulfur. I could even taste the acidity of the smoke from where I stood. We were petrified. The creature slowly walked towards us. It was gigantic. We were overwhelmed by its presence, certain that we would die. Kyle dropped to the floor as his legs gave out. I was crying, praying to God to help us. The creature laughed at us. It looked at me with its massive, fiery eyes and licked its lips. You will be my wife. It continued laughing. Its voice was thunderous. The creature pointed at Kyle, revealing its razor-sharp claws. You have no use for me. I will kill you later. Try to outrun me. Go. Kyle immediately pulled himself up. He glanced at me and ran falling several times on his way down the hiking trail. I was left there, alone, not knowing what to do. I already accepted death as the quickest solution. The creature jumped and was now on top of me. I choked at the smoke coming from its body and lost consciousness. I was completely out of it when I woke up. I didn't even remember how I got out of the forest. All I knew was I got up and walked for hours. I vaguely remember having crossed paths with some of the villagers at the foot of the mountain. Each one gasped in terror as if they had seen a ghost. I kept walking until a village elder approached me. She was carrying a towel and covered me up. I didn't realize that I was bottomless and bleeding which explained the look on villagers' faces. 
the elder brought me to her house and told me she was an albulario. After giving me clothes, she took a chicken and slit its throat while uttering some words that appeared to be a prayer. Without asking what happened to me, she told me I was attacked by a tikbalang, a half-man, half-horse demon. The only way to end this is the next time it comes to you, ride it and pluck the golden hair from its nape. Many police and locals arrived to look for my companions in the forest. I learned from police officers that Alan's pale body was attacked by more leeches and Kyle was drowned in a shallow creek, not far from where I fainted. As I was carried inside an ambulance, the albulario whispered that it wasn't over. The Tikbalang will come back for you and your son. My son returned home with a bandage on his face. He handed me a medal as he beamed with joy. He said that he won the 100 meter dash in his school's track and field tournament, but tripped as he neared the finish line as he wasn't able to control his speed. His face planted to the ground. I asked you not to join any running contests. Half of me wanted to hug and congratulate him, but the other half was worried about his wound. I tried to replace the bandage, but the wound dried up. The bruise darkened, then faded away. This wasn't new to me, because my son exhibited special abilities ever since he was born. I was assaulted by an evil half-horse, half-human creature called Dikbalang. Ten years later, the thought of it still shakes me to the core. But why, Mom? Ian asked, shaking me from my painful past. I don't want you to get hurt. But the truth was, I was afraid that people would learn of his special abilities. My phone vibrated, and I checked the notifications. It was a Facebook memory, a picture of two men who were members of the hiking group I was once a part of. Who are they? Ian asked as he curiously looked at my screen. They were my best friends. It was ten years ago, but I still feel the pain of losing my first boyfriend and best friend. I'll never forget the day that Dick Balang killed them. The acidity of its smell, the smoke that blurred my vision, its stiff, unyielding body, and his monstrous appearance. I'm always filled with dread when I think about what will happen to my son in the future. I recall the Albulario, who warned me that the Dick Balang would return. Is everything okay, hon? My husband Jordan asked. I didn't notice he came home. Dad, I won the track and field competition even without running shoes. Ian showed off his medal. Really? Wow. I will buy you a pair so you can practice. He gave Ian a hug. My husband Jordan helped me forget my dark past. Best of all, he treats my son like his own. My knight in shining armor. My father died. We need to go to my hometown, Jordan said somberly. I'm sorry for your loss, honey. I told my husband. Ian and I are always here for you. He was always there for me, so I promised that I would comfort him in these trying times. I didn't expect, however, that his province was near the Devil's Mountain, which I swore I would never return to. Jordan's house in Risal Laguna was located near the foot of the mountain of San Cristobal. I recognized the same eeriness from years ago. Dark, foggy, demonic... I warned my son not to go close to the mountain. Then Jordan gave him a pair of shoes that he bought while we were on our way to Laguna. This is your reward. Ian shouted in excitement, put them on and ran to test it. I tried running after him, but he was too fast and disappeared. I was nervous when he didn't come back, but after a few minutes, he was back, celebrating his new running shoes. He wanted to run some more, but I told him that it was getting dark. He was stubborn until we heard faint thuds that scared the life out of me. Jordan, whatever happens, please protect our son, I urged my husband. Why are you overreacting? What's going on? He asked. The faint thuds disappeared. Jordan dismissed it as a hiker's footsteps. Jordan had to leave to prepare for his father's funeral. While Ian and I were having dinner, I heard faint thuds again. And then it became louder. 
It could be the Balbal, Ian hypothesized. I hugged my son and we went to our room. I locked the door and all the windows. I tried to peek out the window and saw the silhouette of a half horse, half man leaving the area. The creature might have left because of the arrival of the funeral parlor's car. They carefully placed the casket in front of the house and soon visitors arrived. Out the window, I saw Jordan mingling with guests. Then I felt drowsy. I closed my eyes and I was tired from the trip. I saw the eyes of the demon monster fiery with sulfur. It was staring at me and grinning as it took a big bite out of a boy who was sobbing. I woke up and saw the head of the demon horse peeking through our open window. It had blood on its mouth and he revealed his razor sharp teeth. I quickly thought of my son, who should have been sleeping beside me, but he was gone. It was then that I felt someone shaking me. Honey, you're having a nightmare, wake up. I realized it was just a dream. I was relieved. Where is Ian? Jordan asked me. I immediately looked at the window and saw that it was open just like in my dream. Ian was missing. Rumors had spread that my son was missing. The townspeople looked around the neighborhood. They noticed big marks of big hooves that looked like it came from a very big horse. An elder mentioned the Tikbalang that resided in the mountain, but everyone laughed. The Tikbalang would never leave the mountain, a woman said. They said it was harmless and only played tricks on hikers. Upon my pleading, Jordan asked the mountain rangers to look for our son in Mount San Cristobal. When they didn't return, I became restless. I asked Jordan to come with me to look for Ian in the Devil's Mountain, but he refused. I wasn't sure if it was because he was afraid or if he was too busy with his father's wake, so I decided to go to the mountain by myself. I embarked on my journey despite the sun shower. The trail was uphill and had too many trees. It was slippery and took me until night to reach the middle of the forest, where I believe the Dick Balang resided. A massive bolt of lightning struck the sky, followed by deafening thunder. Although the rain had ceased, it appeared that another downpour was on the way. I was terrified of the lightning, but it helped light my way. I endeared the eerie mountain, loud howls, whispers, and even the sight of the mountain rangers who looked for my son. All of them, dead. Then I came to a massive baleti tree. It was so huge and creepy. I had seen century-old baleti trees from other mountains before, but that one was different, yet familiar. I detected the same stench and realized it was the same baleti tree from 10 years ago where I met the thick balang. The tree had doubled its size. I overheard a thunderous laughter. Then I finally got a glimpse of the devilish monster sitting beside the tree. The Tikbalang got so big that it seemed to be as tall as the tree. It lowered its head, staring at me mockingly. I shouted at the monster, asking for my son. I gave the huge beast a slap, using all of my might that it echoed throughout the forest. The beast just chuckled, unfazed. I kept slapping him, but he just gave me an evil grin. I came prepared with a dagger that I bought a long time ago. I swung it to its face multiple times and saw how its flesh was torn apart, but I didn't see much blood. Its cuts healed on its own, similar to what I saw with my son's wound. I took a few steps back in dread. The demon horse remained seated and grinned. Then he flung his arm out and I hit the ground, losing control of my dagger. I was dragged closer to it and I couldn't break free. Rough stones, small tree branches, and plant thorns pierced my skin, causing pain. It was hot, tingly, and then numb. His razor sharp claws moved and tore my clothes. You are mine. The Tik Balang declared as another series of lightning flashed in the sky. My son appeared out of nowhere, sprinting towards us and striking the Tik Balang in the stomach with his head. I'm impressed. Not bad, son. The demon horse monster laughed. It seized my son and tossed him to the ground. Ian's body rolled several times before colliding with the tree. I begged him not to hurt him and cried. I told Ian to run and stay away. My son should have been seriously hurt, 
But something inside him awakened. He got up, saw my dagger, grabbed it, and dashed towards his demonic father as another lightning struck the skies. But he couldn't stand a chance against the Tikbalang, who was too huge and vicious for him. It stood up and snatched my son's neck, lifting him against the Baleti tree. The dagger slid from my son's fingers and landed somewhere I couldn't see. But I did see that my son was gasping for air as the monster choked him. I pleaded to the Tikbalang to take my life instead. I cried to the heavens for help. It seemed that the sky was crying with me as the rain got stronger. But the demon wasn't listening. He was just standing there until it let go of my son and fell to its knees like it was hurt. On his back was my husband. Jordan plucked the golden hair from the Tikbalang's nape, immediately jumped on the back of the creature and rode it. I later learned that he asked the elder for help and was told the Tikbalang's greatest weakness. And since then, the enormous monster has been our slave. Ray was an average guy living in a small town. He was married to a beautiful woman and had two kids, a dog, and a nice house with a pool. Many might say that he lived the American dream. His children were very adventurous, always wanting to spread their wings and travel to different parts of the country. But Ray preferred to stay home, always visited the same places, and kept his social circle small. There was a time when his spirit was as lively as his children's, but that was years ago. Decades of adrenaline rush and adventures that ended in the worst way possible. Many times the memories of that night came back to haunt him, like when journalists knock on his door, asking for an interview. Then the memories would pour back in. Years ago, Ray was not only a fan of adventures, but also of horror. He grew up knowing that he would one day be a famous ghost hunter and reveal the secrets of the dead. However, as time went on, he believed less and less in the afterlife, demons, and mythical creatures. It was all fake to him, and just a big fat check. As Ray watched TV one evening, his phone rang. It was Juan, his best friend, calling from Puerto Rico to congratulate him on his new show's success. Juan was as ambitious as he was. And as soon as Ray answered the phone, he knew his friend would have an enticing proposal. Only three minutes into the call, Juan told him about a monster supposedly roaming the area. The Chupacabras. A monstrous creature that was first seen in Puerto Rico. It attacks livestock at night and consumes their blood, and is also known as a goat sucker. Juan explained that chupacabras were blamed for recent attacks on goats, sheep, and other domestic animals the past month, and had left behind a trail of uneaten carcasses that were completely drained of blood. Ray was instantly interested, and not even a week later, left for Puerto Rico. He spent the vacation days he could have enjoyed with his family on this trip. But this was going to be worth it for his new vlog. After doing research, he found out that the chupacabras were nothing more than wolves or hyenas with rabies, and the paranoia of the villagers only added to the appeal of the legend. After arriving at the airport, Juan greeted him with a huge grin and invited him out to lunch. The two were childhood friends and happily caught up with each other, but they were both clear about their goal. To catch the chupacabras on video. So, without wasting any time, they finished eating, planned a night in the forest, and in the evening got down to business. They knew it was going to be dangerous, so they both brought shotguns to protect themselves from any wild beasts. The first few hours of their night were uneventful, and Juan had fallen asleep, so Ray just went live on Instagram and answered his fans' questions. But then suddenly, 
Ray felt like the luckiest man in the world and started recording. He heard an animal screaming desperately in pain, and when he looked around, he saw it on the ground, butchered, and a shadowy figure was digging into its stomach. Ray was too shocked to scream. Juan woke up from his nap. He began to shoot in the direction of the strange being. Somehow, the creature used the goat as a shield and quickly took off deep into the forest. They both followed it, Ray leading the way. But when they walked towards its direction, Ray saw the hole in the stomach of the poor goat's belly and felt fear for the very first time. What kind of predator would do this? It wasn't even eaten, just ripped into shreds and drained of blood. Ray was taking some photos and recording the poor animal when his battery died. So they stayed quiet and continued looking for the creature. As they walked deeper into the forest, they held onto their weapons for dear life, not knowing where the creature was hiding or when it would attack. Their heartbeat increased as they followed the trail left behind of the corpses of several local animals, all completely drained of blood. The only thing that provided them with a sense of comfort was the sounds of crickets and the koki koki. After following Juan for a while in darkness, all Ray could hear were footsteps in front of him. Ray tried to keep up with Juan, but to no avail because his footsteps were joined by another's. The footsteps were strange. It sounded like a four-legged animal. And then, it started running. Little by little, Ray began to lose track of the footsteps until suddenly it was quiet. And then he heard a creature scream in agony. He knew they weren't far from each other, and he tried to stay positive. He was sure Juan either caught the beast or lost it. Ray walked a little further into the forest only to find Juan, thanks to the glow of the moonlight. He approached him in relief, asking if he lost the goat killer. Juan didn't answer, so Ray asked if he was okay. Suddenly, Juan's body fell backward. As he took a couple of steps towards Juan, he noticed with surprise that his neck had been clawed and screamed so loud that it echoed throughout the forest. <coughs> Suddenly, Ray felt like throwing up and started to feel dizzy. He thought he was going to faint. He ran around in circles yelling for help. While he was processing everything that had happened, he realized that he wasn't alone. He started shooting his gun all around the forest until he heard a growl. Ray's only reaction was to pee his pants when he turned around and watched as the strange being opened the belly of Juan's corpse with its sharp claws and fangs. It was very dark, but he could tell that this being was a little short. It had four legs and long claws. It almost looked like a hairless dog mixed with a reptile. Its red eyes were huge as it stared at Ray. And it kept digging and pulling out all his friend's guts as if it were soil. Ray couldn't control his emotions and let out a scream that was barely heard. Or so he thought, as the creature growled in anger. Ray aimed his gun at the creature and pulled the trigger. He realized he was all out of bullets. It stopped digging, and Ray just froze in fear as it slowly walked towards him. When it was only a few feet away, he could feel his breathing intensify. The creature's eyes were fixated on Ray's neck, which was surely going to be its next target. At that moment, Ray's whole eye flashed before his eyes. He regretted not spending more time with his wife or children. He regretted not being happier. He regretted prioritizing fame over his family, and he regretted being an idiot and not being more prepared. As he wept, the creature stood in front of him, 
Its face trembled in anticipation, and its claws were ready to pierce his skin. Seeing it up close, he quickly understood that this could not be a wolf with rage. It was a chupacabra. With this mythical being in front of him, he could only close his eyes and accept his fate. When suddenly, a loud noise shattered his eardrums. A rifle had been fired in his direction, and after a short war cry from the chupacabra, the creature just vanished from the area. While locals came to assist Ray. When Ray told the story to the world, no one believed him. They all thought he was just trying to get more views and called him an idiot for even going into a forest at night. The footage on his phone wasn't clear enough and the last video he recorded hadn't been saved. He was only approached by journalists or a few young horror enthusiasts who wanted to make the same mistake that ended his friend's life and almost his own. Ray never stepped foot in a forest again and whenever a journalist approached him to ask what happened, he only said that his memories were very blurry and that surely they were only attacked by a big bad wolf. It's been so long since we've come out here to camp. I always forget how creepy the woods get at night. Sebastian murmured to Eliza as he reached over to turn up the heat. It was pitch black, with nothing in front of them for miles except dense trees and snow on the ground. They had left the house late, and now they were going to be setting up their campsite in the dark. The car was full of unspoken tension. Eliza still thought they left late because Sebastian was being really particular about how the car was packed. While he was angry that she hadn't prepped the food the night before, as he suggested. It probably wasn't anyone's fault, but here they were once again, being passive-aggressive and not communicating. Maybe we should just head back, Eliza sighed. It's already darker than we planned, not to mention it wasn't supposed to start snowing for another two weeks. I feel like we might have missed our chance to get a trip in this winter. She kept her eyes on the road, but stole glances at her husband here and there. He just kept scrolling on his phone, not acknowledging her. She didn't like this quiet resentment that sat between them, and she was trying to find the right thing to say to defuse the situation. The whole purpose of this trip was to reconnect, rekindle their relationship that was now in shambles. Or at least that's what their marriage counselor advised them to do. Sebastian let out a deep breath and put away his phone. He kept his eyes forward, staring at the snow as it swirled in front of them, not looking at his wife as he spoke. I guess you're right. Screw it. Let's just go back. They had both hoped that making the call to give up would ease up some of the tension. But unfortunately, it didn't work. It only got worse. Before they could even pull over to turn the car around, something moved in front of their car, making Eliza slam on the brakes and come to a screeching, sliding stop. Silence fell over the car for a moment. Nothing but the sound of Sebastian and Eliza trying to catch their breath, both tingling with a flood of adrenaline running through their bodies. Eliza was the first one to speak. Seb, what the hell was that? By that, she meant the figure that had jumped right in front of the car. It was tall, over six foot, and built like a pro wrestler. And there were definitely arms and a head and two legs there. But it didn't look human. I, uh, I have no idea. Sebastian tried to respond, staring at the thing. The creature was standing only a few feet from their front bumper, obscured by the darkness. It had what looked like ten foot long wings. They arced up higher than its head and swept down elegantly towards the ground. It wasn't moving, and the couple felt like they were somehow suspended in time. 
Seb, call the cops, Eliza said. Sebastian quickly fumbled out his phone and started dialing 911. While Eliza stared at the figure, trying to decide what to do next, she reached for her door handle and prepared to get out of the car. What the hell are you doing? He said as the phone rang. I just want to see what it is. Eliza looked dazed as her words dropped away. I mean, maybe it's a statue that the wind blew in. Or a man-sized bird like an eagle. It's not moving. Sebastian opened his mouth to protest. But then the 911 operator answered and his attention was pulled back to the phone. He began frantically giving the operator a description of their location while trying to make himself sound not completely crazy. He looked around. Yeah, we're on Highway 62. While Sebastian was distracted, Eliza slipped out into the cold night air. The car engine was still running, high beams on, and she had a small utility knife clutched in one hand for a sense of safety. Her breath fogged in the cold air as she took cautious steps towards the thing. It still hadn't moved, and she couldn't make up her mind whether it was a living creature or not. She came to a stop just a few feet away from it and froze, listening to the sound of her own breath. She didn't have the chance to plan her next move, though. The creature was alive. It turned to face her, spreading its wings and raising its face as it moved, shuffling towards her. Its skin was dark and covered in wiry looking fur, but its body was the shape of a large, strong man's. As it extended its wings, Eliza gasped. <gasps> they were broad and looked powerful. She immediately ran back into the car, locked the doors, and sped away. Sebastian hung up the phone. What happened? What is it? He kept asking questions, but Eliza was too focused on the road, going a hundred miles per hour. Sebastian looked out the window and was surprised to see the creature chasing them. Flying towards the car and ready to swoop down at any moment and attack. Before Sebastian could scream, Eliza cried out. It's Mothman. She remembered all the newspaper articles she stumbled upon on the humanoid. In an instant, Mothman flew down and landed on the road, several feet before them. They were about to crash into the creature with great force, but the creature stopped the car with its hands and didn't even flinch. Eliza slowly looked up at the creature and saw two huge red glowing eyes staring into her soul. It towered over the vehicle and she suddenly felt very small and vulnerable. Finally, it tilted its head and the creature's blazing red eyes looked into hers. Sebastian had been closing his eyes, anticipating the impact. But when there was none, he opened his eyes. He looked over at Eliza. She wasn't moving. She was just staring at the beast, whatever it was. Neither of them were moving or making a sound. They just stared into each other's eyes, emitting a sense of pure evil. Sebastian scrambled out of the car as quickly as he could, filled with the urgent need to run away. But as soon as he stepped out of the car, Mothman grabbed him, and Eliza followed. He saw her face, and the person standing there didn't look like his Eliza anymore. Her eyes glowed red, the same shade as the monster's. Before Sebastian could react, she charged towards him with a loud shriek. Their little knife was in her hand, and she didn't hesitate to thrust the blade into his neck. He felt the pain of it, 
but that wasn't as bad as the sound it made. He heard it when the blade tore through his windpipe and then scraped against a bone. He felt like the air had suddenly been sucked out of the world. But really, his lungs were just hanging, useless inside his body. He felt a hot spill of blood running down his neck from the wound. And then she stabbed him again. As his body hit the ground, Eliza threw her body over his and kept stabbing. Even after the last bit of breath gurgled out of him. And she did it all under the calm, watchful gaze of the Mothman. All of a sudden, she snapped out of it and heard the loud police sirens approaching. She looked around. Mothman had risen up straight into the sky like a helicopter and flew away. And then she looked down at Sebastian's body, which was ripped apart. She was the monster. Eliza slumped on the ground, exhausted by her manic attack, and realized that her life was now over. She was too shocked to even shed a tear for her husband. No one would believe her story. She had no proof. Mothman was long gone. Yup, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got into this situation. Well, it started when I met Mang Sar during my vacation in Surigao del Sur located in Mindanao, Philippines. The goal was to visit the Enchanted River, where mermaids, pixies, and fairies supposedly dwelled. But I had no idea I would cross paths with a flesh-eating, terrifying, alien-looking creature. My name is Sheila, and my companion on that trip was Karen. Back in high school, we were both on the varsity swimming and diving team, and had won many national awards. That's when we became close friends and vowed to travel the world together once we finished college. When we arrived in town, we heard a lot of rumors regarding Mang Cesar. The story goes that he had an encounter with a horrifying entity called Shokoi. According to the locals, a Shokoi is a humanoid creature from the Bantai Tubig or Merfolk. It has green scaly skin, tentacles, webbed hands and fins, and legend has it that they live inside the caves near rivers and oceans. Mangsi Sar claimed that the Shokoi tried to lure him into mystical caves, but he was lucky enough to escape. From that point onwards, he vowed to never swim in the Hinatuan Enchanted River again, and had warned everyone not to go near the area, especially his son. Instead, he advised everyone to go swim in the local cold spring, which was close by. One day, his only child defied him and swam in the enchanted river at night. The child was never seen again after that. Mang Sar was seen sobbing by the riverbank, clutching his ten-year-old son's slippers. After that, he was spotted shooing away tourists who wanted to swim in the river but he was reprimanded by the town officials, who told him to allow the people to enjoy the water. Everyone thought Mang Sar was a lunatic at the time, and he was treated as an outcast. After all, the Enchanted River was supposed to be a secret place with beautiful creatures guarding the waters, and was also a very popular tourist spot. He still visited the area though, and warned tourists against jumping into the water. That's how we met Mang Sar. He saw us approaching and immediately ran over to us. The water is too cold for swimming. You can get sick, he said. He also told us about the creature known as the Shokoi, and told us that we should go to the nearby resort instead, where we would be safe. Of course, we ignored him and thought he was crazy. We didn't know that doing so would turn out to be a fatal mistake. Being excellent swimmers meant Karen and I always engaged in healthy competition, but it was Karen who consistently won first place, and I came in second. We became the best of friends despite competing in numerous swimming competitions against each other. The Philippines was recommended to us by another swimmer for a summer vacation. The crystal clear sapphire blue waters are what attracted us the most. It was truly breathtaking. 
The water is clear because someone is taking care of it, Mang Cesar stated. Karen immediately took off her dress and had her swimsuit underneath. Mang Cesar got spooked when he saw Karen dive into the water. He immediately ran away. We simply left and I took off my clothes to jump in. I was in my swimsuit when I suddenly got the feeling of being watched. Karen and I looked around but didn't see anyone nearby. All we could see was Mang Cesar in the far distance still running away from the river. I joined Karen and we decided to have a contest to see who could swim across the river first. Karen laughed. And what will be the prize? She asked. A halo halo, I answered. We swam towards the riverbank, then counted to three. One, two, two three. three. The current was strong, but Karen managed to cross the river first. I, on the other hand, struggled and was taken by the current towards a cave. All I remember and saw was a narrow entrance to the cave where the water flowed far away. In the blink of an eye, I saw a blurry shadow of what looked like a big green fish-like creature pop up from underneath the water. It quickly disappeared when Karen swam towards me. Did you see that? I asked Karen. See what? Karen asked as she looked at the direction of where I was pointing. It was also at that moment when I felt I was cramping up, so Karen assisted me in getting out of the water. We rested for a while and had a delicious picnic. We ate chicken barbecue and rice cake wrapped in banana leaves. Karen threw the leaves into the river after she finished. I was shocked. You shouldn't have done that. Karen argued. But it's biodegradable. She remarked and also threw the barbecue stick into the water. After a while, Karen remembered the cave and got curious about it. So she told me that she wanted to go back there. Did you know that no one has ever reached the bottom of the river? Supposedly, there are underwater tunnels that lead down into a subterranean cave system. They've also discovered underwater chambers and more tunnels leading off into uncharted territory. Explorers have only gone down 200 feet, which they think is only scratching the surface. Since I wasn't fully recovered from the cramps, I told her it was dangerous to go there alone. Maybe there were in fact mythical creatures living in the water. But Karen was adamant and dove back into the water and headed straight for the cave. She got closer to the small entrance and that's when I saw her sink as if something pulled her down. I immediately dove into the water. I swam as fast as I could. When I reached the cave, I went underwater. Everything happened so quickly, I lost track of time. The moment I opened my eyes, right in front of me, was the most terrifying being I had ever seen. In front of my face was what I assumed to be the Shokoi Mang Cesar had warned us about. It had the head of a fish, but the rest of its body was green and covered with scales. The shape of its body was like a man's, and its teeth were as sharp as blades. I immediately panicked and swam away, trying to put distance between us. But the creature didn't chase me. It didn't even move. When I looked back, I saw it holding Karen, who was now struggling to breathe and escape. I mustered enough courage to swim towards it again, to try and snatch her away from it. But before I could grab Karen, the creature suddenly jerked her arm towards its face and took a massive bite out of her flesh. Her blood mixed with the water of the river. I could taste the saltiness from where I was. Karen managed to slip out of the creature's arms. She swam to the surface to catch her breath. I also took the opportunity to swim up and take another breath. All I could hear was Karen screaming in pain. I was about to swim towards her when the creature resurfaced and bit Karen's neck, killing her in the process. At that point, my fight or flight response kicked in. 
I was shouting and weeping loudly while trying my best to reach land. Halfway to the riverbank, I felt a tug on my right leg, and a few seconds later, I felt another tug. This one more forceful than the previous. I swam faster. At that point, I felt a hand pulling me towards the deep water. Once underwater, I saw the creature dragging and nibbling on my right leg. I felt a sharp pain, and the water was filled with my blood. I was getting desperate at this point and was about to give up. I accepted death. Then something hit the water. A big splash. I couldn't comprehend what was happening. When the bubbles cleared, I saw someone else in the water. It was Mang Cesar. He had what looked like a dagger in his hand. He kept stabbing the creature while it gnawed at him. He didn't stop until both of them sank to the bottom of the river. I swam up to the river bank and got out. Once on dry land, I passed out. When I woke up, I was in the hospital. I was told that Mangsi saw her drown trying to save me, and Karen's body was missing, supposedly in an attempt to be the first to reach the bottom of the enchanted river but also rumored to have been devoured by fish or merfolk. Kashima Raiko was walking quickly but apprehensively at the railway station in Hokkaido, Japan. She was bullied for being the new kid in school. On that day, she felt like someone was following her in the station even though it was nearly deserted. She sped up while looking behind to make sure no one was there. Her heart was racing, and her instincts told her that her life was in danger. She made the decision to flee. Not far from where she started running, someone appeared and kicked her left shin, which immediately sent her crashing to the ground. Raiko cried out in pain while holding her scraped up leg. When she looked up, she saw her new classmates grinning at her. Who says we'll allow an ugly kid like you into our school? said a girl. Raiko bowed her head meekly. Please, I don't want any trouble. Just let me be. I want to go home, she pleaded. The two girls grabbed Raiko by the hair and dragged her near the platform. All she could do was cry in pain. Then they grabbed her hands and feet and threw her onto the tracks right when a train was approaching, and Raiko lost consciousness upon impact. The story goes that Raiko was split in half by the train. Her lower body was shredded to pieces. The violent nature of her death turned her into an onryo, or vengeful ghost, known as the Teke Teke. The Teke Teke took the lives of the two girls who bullied her by splitting their bodies in half. It is said that the name comes from the sound of her nails clawing on the ground as she chases her victims. This is the story of how I know the Teke Teke. It's because bad luck follows me wherever I go. My parents died in a car accident when I was little, and that changed everything. I survived the accident, but was left scarred for life. No, I, I actually have a scar on my face. No child should ever have to go through that kind of trauma and loss. Fast forward to several years later, I moved in with distant relatives, which included my second cousin. After constantly moving around, I hoped this would be more long term. At first, my cousin Yuko was welcoming. We were the same age and in the same classes. But after her boyfriend, Koji, introduced himself to me, she instantly became jealous and avoided me unless it was to remind me that I should be grateful that she took me in. After school one day, Koji caught up with me to ask how I was adjusting. He took my heavy bag and told me he would carry it for me since he was coming over to study. You shouldn't go home by yourself. It's dangerous around here at night. I'll try to convince Yuko to let you join us. Yuko came out of nowhere, grabbed my bag and opened it. She inspected the contents before emptying it out. My books fell to the ground, along with a photograph of my parents. 
Koji picked it up and asked, Are they your parents? I nodded. Yuko took the picture, looked at it, and tore it to pieces. No wonder you're ugly. I got down on my knees and gathered my books, as well as the remnants of my parents' photo. Stay away from my boyfriend. She threw my bag on the ground and stormed away. Koji helped me pick up my belongings, which were now dirty. Yuko called him over and after a moment of hesitation, he apologized and left. I kept my distance from Yuko after that. We lived in the same house, but were complete strangers who didn't acknowledge one another's existence. Slowly, things became a little better. I made a few friends and even joined clubs. I was most excited for the creative writing one. Ever since I was little, writing stories where I'm the main character has always been how I cope with life. But lo and behold, Koji had also joined the club. As soon as he saw me, he ran over and sat next to me. I must admit, he was quite handsome, and I had developed a tiny crush on him after seeing him at home so often. Hey, I'm sorry about Yuko, he quietly said. We shouldn't be talking. Why are you even here? I enjoy writing. It allows me to escape even for a moment. Yeah, I'm sure you need that. When we were done for the day, classmates told me to be careful because supposedly there was a murderer on the loose. A few girls around my age had gone missing, last seen walking around the railway station. I can accompany you. I'll just pretend I had to pick up something at your place. For a brief moment, I had forgotten that Koji was dating my cousin and stopped by whenever he wanted. As enticing as it sounded to have him walk me home, I couldn't. Please don't. Yuko would kill me. Koji shrugged his shoulders as I walked away. I made it to the railway station safely. For precaution, I quickened my pace during my walk and kept a low profile. It was late and the station was deserted. All I could think about was Koji. How we probably had more things in common than him and Yuko. How I always catch him looking at me from the corner of my eye. After entering the train platform, someone punched the back of my head. It was then accompanied by the sound of a glass bottle shattering on my head. Blood gushed out as I fell to the ground. I was disoriented and about to black out when I heard Yuko's voice. You think you belong here? Yuko turned me over to face her. She spat on my face. I was dizzy. I wasn't able to reply, and this made her angry. This one deserves to experience at least one fleeting moment of excitement in her life before we end it. No knife today, hun. Koji grabbed me by the hair and started dragging me. Goodbye, cuz. She uttered, then picked up both my feet. Too bad no one will miss you. I was pleading for them to stop when I heard the train approaching. I looked at my cousin while tears rolled down my cheeks, trying to find even just a dash of reluctance or sympathy. But all I saw was pure evilness in her eyes. Then, in an instant, she was split in two. Her upper half was sliced off from her lower half so effortlessly. Her blood spilled out. Her lower body was still standing when her upper body fell. I just froze. Koji screamed and finally let go of my hair. The sudden and gruesome death of Yuko didn't immediately register in my brain. I stared at the two halves. It was horrifying. I had to look away. Then it hit me. The killer was still there. When I looked up, there was a demon-like creature that was also missing her lower body. She was wearing old, tattered, soiled clothes and had long black hair. In her right hand was a scythe, which she used to split Yuko in half. 
I was too stunned to speak and didn't dare move an inch. She dropped the scythe and moved towards me by clawing the floor. Her movements were odd and unreal. Her claws were making a unique sound when they hit the floor. The sound was something like a ticket ticket. She stopped an inch away from me, grabbed my face, and looked directly into my eyes. Surprisingly, I found more humanity in hers. I shivered from the touch of her cold, clammy skin. Suddenly, she licked the side of my face from my chin up to my forehead. She let go of me and looked at Koji. He took a step back. The creature grinned and quickly pushed herself from the floor towards him as he ran away. She landed on his back and clawed open his neck. Blood gushed from his gaping wound as he fell to the ground. And she didn't stop there. She got on top of him and started clawing on his belly until his upper body was separated from his lower body. It's strange because I didn't feel sorry for them. Afterwards, the creature took a quick glance at me and smiled. She took off to the dark corner of the train station and disappeared. Only after this incident did I learn about the urban legend of the Teke Teke. And I am forever grateful that the Teke Teke saved my life that day. We never know how we'll react to our greatest fears until we're forced to come face to face with them. That was certainly the case for these two friends. Lara and Maria were young women living in Barcelona. They always loved horror stories. I don't know what I should read next, Maria said while walking next to her best friend. Why don't you try something by Emilio Bueso? Lara asked. I don't like Spanish writers. I prefer something more mainstream. We have great Spanish writers, Maria. She felt that her friend didn't always share the same interests as her. How about we go to your house today and look up scary stories? Have a horror-themed night. Lara suddenly remembered a story she came across a few days ago. It had been circulating around their school. The hairs on her body stood up. Do you know the legend of the blind maiden? Lara asked as she walked beside her friend. The Blind Maiden? What's it about? It's popular on the internet. We can read it together and test it out, she said with an intense look. When the two friends arrived at Laura's house, Maria was very excited about the story they were going to read. I'm curious, let's read it now. We have to wait until midnight, Laura responded with a monotone voice. Why? I know it's horror, but it doesn't have to be read at night. I guess we can. Do you know that there is a new moon tonight? It's absolutely necessary for this to work. New moon? Maria asked, intrigued. When the moon is invisible. I see, but what does that have to do with the story? Maria was confused. Come, let's read the story. Laura took her friend's hand and led her to the bedroom. The two friends sat at the computer and began reading. The story was like many other internet legends, which served to keep people up at night. Is that why you were talking about the moon? Do you actually believe this is true? Maria asked. We could try. You can spend the night here. Laura was excited. But it says you have to be be alone and with the lights off at midnight on a moonless night i know maria i know it perfectly lara interrupted have you ever tried it no are you afraid we're just going to rehearse it <sighs> okay maria sighed she was concerned about her friend's sanity a few hours passed they had dinner and watched a horror movie to set the mood at 11.55, Lara stared wide-eyed at her friend. It's time. Let's go to the computer. She said with half her face hidden by the darkness of the room. 
The girls sat together, staring impatiently at the computer. They found the website that was mentioned in the story and tried to access it. Nothing happened. I knew nothing would happen. You have to do it alone, Maria said, relieved. I know. This has helped us prepare, though. We have the website now. Let's try it separately tomorrow and then share our experiences. I guess we can try, Maria said, avoiding her friend's eyes. The next day, the girls woke up and went to their university. They didn't speak about what had happened the night before. In fact, they didn't speak much that day. Maria tried to avoid Laura. However, when they were dismissed from class, Laura caught up with Maria at the exit. Hi there, Laura said, very excited. Hi there. Maria was glad to see her friend acting like her usual self again. Tonight's the night we visit the Blind Maiden website on our own, Laura stated. Yeah, Maria answered when she saw that her friend wouldn't forget the deal they made. It will be a moonless night again, so we have to try it. It's super exciting. Laura was eager to get home. Okay, let's call each other once we finish, Maria said anxiously. When Laura got home, she sent a message to her friend at 11.55 p.m., reminding her of the rules for the optimal experience. It's almost time. Make sure you follow the rules. Maria just responded with an okay. Laura left her phone on the bed. She didn't want anything to distract her. She sat in front of the computer with the lights off, and as soon as she saw the time in the corner of the monitor, she accessed the website. The screen was blank at first. Nothing happened. Suddenly, there were strange images. Quick flickers of frames with different faces, some of them eyeless children. One after the other, twisted with fear and mouths wide open. They were deformed faces with torn up skin and empty eye sockets, full of blood and darkness. The mouths of these people were grimaces of pain, while blood trickled down from what was left of their eyes. The images were terrible. Lara didn't know if they were real or photoshopped. Just thinking about those victims made a chill run through her body. She enjoyed that feeling of terror, that irrational fear from which she could not escape. Immediately, the images on the screen stopped, and a message appeared. This website will take you to a whole new level of horror, a horror that will use all five of your senses. You must be very careful not to click on anything by accident. You will be faced with a real experience of absolute horror. Below the text were two buttons, the option to accept or decline. The narrator warned the visitor not to click accept and advised clicking decline for safety. Laura smiled slightly. She loved that feeling of fear, the same feeling she got when she watched a good horror movie or read a book that kept her up at night. Of course, she clicked accept. The screen went blank again, but a moment later, Laura froze. The fear she now felt was very different. Dangerous. Before her eyes, on the computer screen, was a dark figure moving slowly down a dark hallway. Laura couldn't believe what she was seeing. Her eyes widened. To her surprise, she observed on her monitor the silhouette walking inside her house. She wanted to wake up from this nightmare. She wished it was a nightmare. She couldn't take her eyes off the screen. The humanoid shadow with bony arms and legs kept walking, examining each door she passed. Paralyzed by fear, Laura couldn't move a muscle and watched as the specter approached the very room she was sitting in. Laura felt the greatest of terrors while the silhouette opened the door. Laura saw on the computer screen how the figure walked to a person who was sitting in front of a computer. The room was familiar. On her screen was her very own back. The pores of the skin on her back and shoulder prickled, 
This was her own room, and someone was watching her from behind. Lara didn't know what to do. She saw how the terrifying figure approached her back and raised her hands to grab her. She felt the muffled breaths on the back of her neck. Her instinct was to turn around to see if there was really someone else in her room. She felt a presence behind her, but was too scared to turn around. Then she felt a tap on her shoulder. She faced the fear and turned around quickly to see the face of an eyeless woman. The last thing she saw before she died was the face of a blind maiden staring at her mercilessly with empty eye sockets, mumbling something she couldn't quite make out, then piercing her eyes with her sharp fingernails, digging and ripping them out of her sockets and before leaving, taking a snapshot of her face so that it would forever be a part of the website's photo gallery. Maria stared at her monitor. Only three rules to make sure this was a success. You must be alone, check. You must turn off all your lights, almost check. She was too scared to turn off her desk lamp and visit the website at midnight on a moonless night. Well, it was now 12.05. She had been debating whether or not she wanted to participate in Lara's silly game. Fine, Maria turned off her lights and went on the website. The screen was blank at first. Nothing happened. Then suddenly, one after the other, her screen was flooded with a collection of images of different victims with their eyes gouged out and facial expressions of silent screams. And then the sight froze on one photo. Laura, followed by a pop-up message. Maria declined. Yup, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got into this situation. All alone, sick, in a foreign country where I don't even speak the language fluently, and in the dark, the ghost caressing my face. My name is Amy, and I'm really careful about COVID now. When I leave my house, I always wear a mask. I socially distance myself, especially indoors, and always carry a bottle of hand sanitizer. I wasn't always this way. Last year, in the wake of the pandemic, I was much more irresponsible. I was also on an indefinite vacation in Mexico. Initially, I didn't get the vaccine, as I didn't believe in them. I also didn't have any grandparents or close relatives at risk. Lived alone and worked remotely. I basically went about my life as normal. Until one day, I caught it. At first, the symptoms were exactly like the ones reported on TV. Lack of smell, fever, headaches, and coughing but after a few days, they became more severe. I started having trouble breathing, and my high fever wouldn't go away. To be safe, I decided to go to the hospital, sat in the waiting room for three hours, and to my absolute surprise, I was admitted. It seemed ridiculous to me, so I tried to talk myself out of staying. It was probably going to go away in a few days, but I chickened out and decided to stay. The night in the hospital was really long and stressful. Everyone was swamped with patients, although the door to my room was closed. I remember hearing the sounds of endless frantic footsteps coming and going behind them. Clearly, the hospital was running at full capacity and only a nurse had seen me. The nervous shouting of the healthcare staff didn't stop for a second and kept me awake at night. Still, I got used to the noises and despite the excessive chills, I was able to fall asleep. When I woke up and looked at the clock, I noticed that only about two hours had passed, but it felt like decades. My body was sweating and boiling hot. I couldn't taste or smell my food which was horrifying in and of itself, and my head felt like it was about to explode. I had a horrible nightmare where I couldn't breathe, which quickly turned into sleep paralysis that caused me to wake up terrified. A few seconds after waking up, 
I remembered that I was still in the hospital, and at that very moment, I understood the reason for the nightmare. I was having a hard time breathing. I tried to move, to get out of bed, but I couldn't lift a finger. In a panic, I tried to call the doctor with the emergency button, but it didn't work. I also tried to make a sound and yell, but I was too weak. I felt like I was drowning more and more, and all I could do was listen to the doctors running around outside. From what little I understood, they were all very nervous about an accident. Or maybe it was just my feverish head making me think that the hospital was frantic. Everything that happened at that moment was very confusing. Just as I was desperately gasping for air, something in front of me calmed me down. A different nurse was now standing at the foot of my bed, watching me. I quickly sensed that something was wrong with the nurse, as she just stood at a distance, staring at me. As I surveyed the room with fear, she slowly approached me, and that's when I could tell. The nurse wasn't touching the floor. She was floating. Terror gripped my whole body, and I tried to scream as loud as I could, but not even the smallest murmur came out of my body. The strange being had on a nurse's dress, but it was very old-fashioned, and it was faded and dirty. This nurse seemed to think she was walking. She even made the movements with her feet, but her toes never touched the floor and her body trembled as she hovered towards me. When she reached my bedside, we saw each other's faces for the first time. She was a young nurse, quite pretty, and had a compassionate look in her eyes, but something was wrong with her. When I saw her, my first impulse was to cry, but not from fear or whatever fate this being had planned for me, but to cry because of the sadness reflected in her eyes, full of melancholic sorrow. At that moment, my mind went blank, and I did nothing but feel sorry for her although I didn't know why. Suddenly, she reached her hand towards me and began caressing my face. Her hand was so cold that I snapped out of my trance and panicked again. This girl was clearly not alive. What was she doing to me? I felt I had to desperately run for the door, call for help and escape, regardless of what would happen to me if she caught me. As I was planning my escape, my eyelids began to feel heavy and before I knew it, I was suddenly falling asleep. When I woke up the next day, I felt perfect. It all felt like a dream and I could move my body again. I was over the worst part of the illness and by a miracle, I could breathe perfectly like nothing had happened. The strange ghost was no longer in my room, and strangely, I felt no fear or anything. I just felt lighter, more relaxed. As a nurse entered the room, I realized that there was a picture next to me, where the nurse from my dreams hung. I began to think that maybe she did take care of me and was one of the nurses on duty, and I imagined everything else because of the fever. I asked the nurse who the girl in the picture was, hoping she would tell me that the nurse was either the daughter of a man who built the hospital, a donor, or a woman with a very important position who dressed up as a nurse for fun. The nurse very nonchalantly said that it was La Planchada, a nurse who had died in this very room many years ago. According to the nurse, La Planchada was a dedicated nurse who attended to the patients in this room to save their lives, just as she did with me. Her name was Yuleila. She was a very dedicated nurse in the 1930s, and her patients, sick and poor, were her top priority in life. She was very professional and well-kempt with her clean, ironed uniforms. Many of her colleagues were jealous of her, since she was the favorite amongst doctors and patients. 
But everything changed once a new doctor was hired at the hospital. The handsome, tall Dr. Joaquin, who charmed everyone. He pursued Yulela, and eventually she fell in love with him and became her first boyfriend. This was a distraction and caused her to make mistakes on the job. The doctor didn't love her back the same way. In fact, he ended up breaking her heart. Despite proposing to her, he would flirt with other nurses behind her back. And one day, he left for a two-week medical seminar, and he never returned. After months of waiting for her lover's return, Yulela uncovered the truth. The doctor had resigned from the hospital. He met someone new during his seminar and was now married. The news ruined Yulela. She was never the same. She became cold and neglected her patients. Supposedly, she would forget to give them medication and even gave one of them the wrong injection. The patient died and she was fired. She eventually became sick herself and died at a hospital. She became a ghost after her death and continued to treat patients. Some say it is a kind of atonement for her sins due to the patients who died from her failure to perform her duty as a nurse towards the end of her life. A strange feeling of fear and happiness ran through my body simultaneously. I immediately knew that she had visited me last night and healed me with her touch. At that moment, I felt very grateful, but also creeped out to have been caressed by a ghost. From then on, I decided that I was going to start taking care of myself. Because as easy as this spirit saved my life, Maybe she would take it away from me if she saw me again. Back when I was still in high school, I used to be a member of the dance club along with my best friend Marciana. One day, there was a big event at school and we had to perform. Everything ran smoothly until the main attraction, our dance number. It was one of the highlights of the evening. It was finally our time to perform on stage. Part of the choreography was to switch positions, in which we had to run through the backstage. Here's the catch. There were so many people backstage, all the other performers, makeup artists, models, assistants, and other staff members. We couldn't pass the narrow backstage in time. But there was one other way that Antonio, Marciana's boyfriend, the stage manager, taught us. To go below the stage. The school built that tunnel underneath the stage for this very reason. To make a way for performers to pass through. There was no lighting down there because it was still being constructed. So we took our phones out to light our way. When we were about to reach the other side, we saw an old hermit with a stitched up mouth and long beard and hair. In an instant, Marciana screamed and then collapsed. Antonio and I had to drag Marciana out. The performance was cut short and she was rushed to the hospital. While we were walking home, Antonio was so angry because they told him he couldn't accompany her. He started punching whatever he could and throwing random objects he found on the ground. Please don't. We'll just come back in the morning. Antonio stopped and tossed the stone aside into a nearby mound. In frustration, he approached, kicked, and destroyed it. A few seconds later, a light emanated from what was left of the mound. A small bearded old man in black garments appeared out of nowhere. The old man looked at us with pure hatred in his eyes. Upon closer inspection, we noticed that his mouth was sewn up. We were about to scream and run, but he suddenly vanished right before our eyes. We rushed home since there was a heavy storm that followed. We had no idea that Antonio's carelessness would have such a horrific impact on our lives. The next morning, I suddenly got a text from Marciana. 
She said she was awake now, but not feeling well and vomiting a lot. It was followed by a phone call from Antonio. Alex, I don't feel good, he said in a shivering tone. Are you sick as well? I asked. The line got disconnected. I felt dizzy when I tried to get out of bed, so I asked my mother to come to my room. What is happening? My mother asked. She was shocked when she removed my blanket. Alexandra, your foot is swollen. I then realized I couldn't move my left foot. My mother quickly sent me to the hospital. My foot was x-rayed and I was given medicine. Days passed and my left foot didn't get any better. I also found out that Marciana was still sick and worse. Antonio died. Antonio's death was mysterious and no one knew what caused it. Doctors were unable to provide a diagnosis for sudden illnesses. And my foot had developed an aching wound and had tripled in size. Marciana sent me a picture showing she had grown too much hair all over her body. She developed a beard, which looked funny. But when she mentioned she was urinating a black liquid, I was really worried for her. It was all so bizarre. It was as if someone was trying to punish us. My mother took me to an albulario named Aling Bella. She founded a church which was built thanks to the donations of customers she was able to heal. She prayed before starting the healing ritual, lit a white candle and pointed it towards a basin filled with water. The wax formed a black figure. This is the cause of your pain. We need to hurry before it's too late. This old man is trying to kill you. She warned. She blessed my forehead, took the figure out of the basin, then covered it with paper and put it inside of an empty can. She sprinkled some holy water on top and covered it. Boil this can for an hour for seven days straight. Open it on the seventh day, Aling Bella instructed. My mother gave a 500 peso bill to Aling Bella, but she refused, saying her healing services were free of charge. But you can put it in the donation box of the church. She said firmly as she handed her the donation box. For her wound, apply this essential oil made from the finest herbs. She added while pouring it on my foot. This will cost 500 pesos. When my mother handed her the money, I felt an itch on my foot. Aling Bella quickly handed me a bottle of medicine. This is a natural side effect. It means it's working. Just use this to stop the itch. Anyway, this is free for my new best customer. You deserve it. She opened the bottle and rubbed liquid on the new rash on my foot. I felt a burning sensation. If you cannot tolerate the burning sensation, just ice it along with this handkerchief blessed by the Pope. Only at a discounted price of 500 pesos, you didn't even have to go to Rome. She said as she offered the hanky to my mother. We quickly left as my mother sensed something was fishy. However, my wound seemed to have dried up ever since we went to Aling Bella's miraculous church. I phoned Marciana to tell her to try to go to the same church, but I was shocked by what her mother told me. Marciana became insane, as if possessed by a demon. What happened to my best friends? I wasn't able to visit Marciana as my foot was not fully healed yet. I just spent my days crying. Before the seventh day of boiling the can, I found out that it was opened and the figure was missing. We returned to Aling Bella's church the next day to tell her the can had been opened and my wound had worsened. There were worms inside. The church was closed to prepare for mass, but since Aling Bella lived in a luxurious house next to it, she saw us and let us in. I was carried by my mother and put on the couch. My mother removed the gauze covering my wound and was surprised to see more worms. Aling Bella had a premonition. You are being followed by the old man, Nuno Sapunso. Suddenly, 
A faint, popish laugh could be heard from behind us. The lights flickered, and when we turned around, we saw a little old man with a long beard dressed in black. His mouth was sewn shut, but he could speak without moving his lips. It was as if he was talking right into our minds. You and your friends dare disrespect my home and completely destroy it. My mother knelt in front of him and apologized, but he refused. He spat on her instead, and the fluids from his mouth landed on her face. My mother hid her face behind her hands and screamed in agony. It burned. Aling Bella grabbed a crucifix and held it in front of the man, but the old man just grinned and pointed his ancient finger at her. Aling Bella suddenly twitched and was thrown and pinned on the wall. You abuse the power that my kind gave you and use it for your benefit, shouted the small evil man. The church shook as if there was a huge earthquake. Aling Bella was suffocating as if someone was choking her. Then she passed out. My mother was still covering her face, now with only one hand as her other hand grabbed mine. Please, sir, I'm very sorry for what we did. Please. Don't hurt anyone anymore. I begged for forgiveness as tears rolled down my face. Finally, that's exactly what I needed to hear. He said, then he disappeared. Since that encounter, we've been making offerings to the mound near our house. The mound's old man seems to have forgiven me. My mother's face had a scar which she can hide under some makeup. Marciana, my dearest friend, is gradually regaining her sanity, and her beard has stopped growing. Everything was back to normal. I always make sure I ask for permission when I pass by the mound and say, Dabi Dabi Po. Hanako-san giggled as she waited for her classmates to burst into the bathroom at any moment. It was her turn to be sought. She was in a cheerful mood that afternoon. After all, she was finally starting to fit in after being ridiculed for months. No one trusted her after her parents were labeled as traitors for protesting against the war. She didn't believe it though, to her. It was simply a rumor. Her parents told her that they were going on a trip, and she had faith that they would soon return and pick her up from school. The adults knew the truth, but didn't have the heart to tell her that her parents were thrown in jail and killed for their crimes. That's how Hanaku-san ended up in this orphanage. She yawned. The sun was starting to set, and an hour had gone by. No footsteps, no tiny voices calling out her name. And Anaku-san realized her classmates weren't looking for her. She sighed, crawled out of her hiding spot, and was about to open the bathroom door when... May couldn't wait for recess. She hated school and always felt like an outsider. For some reason, she always had a hard time making friends. It didn't help that she didn't share the same hobbies as the kids around her age. She was more old-fashioned, preferring printed books where she could turn the crisp new pages, the sound of nature, and oldies music. Not that she was picked on for her preferences, but she didn't know which was worse, being bullied or ignored. And that's why she would sneak out during some of her classes and eat lunch in the third floor girls' bathroom. It wasn't bad at all. She enjoyed the acoustics there if she wanted to blast music, or the solitude if she wanted to read. Most faculty and students avoided that part of the school. They found it creepy. But for May, this was her safe place, and she had company. She managed to make one friend in that school, Hannah. She was maybe a year or two younger than May, and she was like a younger sister. 
She remembered the day she met her like it was just yesterday. After not doing so well on her math test, May headed to the bathroom for some peace and quiet. As she entered the room, she heard a little girl crying and saw Hannah sitting inside the third stall, wiping away her tears. May calmed her down, and from that day on, the two girls met up and hung out there almost every day. Hannah didn't speak though, and May didn't bother asking her questions about school. Not in there, where they were escaping it. The two girls would spend most of their afternoons in the girls' bathroom. Listening to music, drawing, and playing games like hide-and-seek. It was uneventful every time. Even though it was such a tiny space, Hannah insisted on being the hider. It always made her giggle, but then she'd frown after she was found and just look out the window as if she was waiting for someone. May never understood the reason why she was always sad and quiet, but she respected Hannah's privacy. She knew her friend would tell her when she was ready. During lunch the next day, May got caught up finishing her science project. She was forced to partner with Ren one of the popular kids who didn't even know she existed before having to work together. Why don't I ever see you during lunch? Ren asked. May didn't look up. I prefer eating by myself. Can we focus, please? I have somewhere to be. Where? It's lunchtime. Ren was confused. May sighed. This boy was too nosy for his own good. The third floor. Oh, you're the weird girl who goes to the bathroom there every day? May was getting annoyed. Ren wasn't even doing any work, but would take all the credit. Do you believe in yokai? May didn't respond. How about Anako-san? She looked up from their project. Who? Before Ren could answer, the bell rang and they had to return to class. As soon as all the students sat down in history class, Ren raised his hand to ask a question. Can you tell us about the ghost in the school? Now, this was everyone's favorite class. Their teacher was young and down to earth. Sure, why not? We have a few minutes before I can start today's lesson. And the teacher explained the legend. As many of you may know, this school was once an orphanage. Unfortunately, during World War II, it was bombed and not a single person survived. Many of the parents of orphans who lived here were killed during the war, whether they were fighting in the war or labeled as traitors. Yeah, 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 but can you tell us about Anaku-san? Well, supposedly, one of the orphans became an evil spirit after she passed, and to this day, haunts this school. People say she was playing hide-and-seek in the girls' bathroom upstairs when the building was bombed. To this day, it's still her favorite game. Now, her poor spirit is stuck in that bathroom, in the third stall where she passed and why we are all forbidden from going up there out of respect. Because if you ask if she is there three times and knock, you might anger her. She might choose to reveal herself, grab you, and flush you down the toilet, down to the fiery pits of hell. The class laughed. Yeah, May said she hangs out there all the time. I'm surprised she's still alive. Her classmates looked at her and laughed more. She's nice. Because you've seen her? Or are you friends? Everyone continued laughing at her. The teacher had to yell at the students to quiet down so that she could continue with her lesson. As soon as they were dismissed, May stormed out of the room. She was furious. But while she was walking down the hallway, Ren pushed her to the side and ran to the staircase. May started running after him when she realized where he was going. 
When she got to the bathroom, Ren was already there. Anaku-san, are you there? He knocked on the stall's door. May pleaded for him to stop. Anaku-san, are you there? He knocked again. No response. But the door opened. Anaku-san wasn't there. Ren shrugged his shoulders and entered the stall. Then he sat on the toilet and started passing gas. Mei was mortified, and she tried to pull him off of the toilet, but he wouldn't budge. Ren just laughed, finished doing business, flushed, and finally stood up. He continued making fun of Mei as he washed his hands. Mei had enough. Why don't you ask it one last time? Mei dared. <sighs> Anaku-san, are you there? Ren knocked again. The lights started flickering. Ren was confused. How did you do that? They watched as the door opened on its own. Then there was a gurgling sound coming from the toilet. The two of them just stared at it as it started shaking. And then they heard a tiny voice. I am here. You found me. Out of nowhere, a long bloody hand popped out of the toilet, reaching out until it could grab the boy's legs before he could escape and pull him into the toilet. Ren screamed and cried as he whirled around in the dirty water. Then he was flushed down, followed by dead silence. Slowly, Anaku-san's head emerged from the toilet. She got out. Mei was amazed and terrified at the same time. Anaku-san and Mei just stared at each other for a moment. Her friends still looked the same, but now she understood her better. Then Anaku-san smiled, and the two pals laughed. The smell of blood, feces, and urine filled the air. It was so strong that it woke me up. The last thing I remembered was running after I opened the last bathroom stall. I just remember tripping on my shoelace and hitting my head on the ground. I slowly touched my head and noticed blood trickling from the fresh gash. I must have blacked out after I fell. I scanned the room and saw my friend Rick laying in front of the last stall. His hands were covered in blood. Rick! I called out. I saw him twitch when he heard his name and wake up. He got up, then screamed while looking inside the cubicle and ran away. As soon as he saw his crimson stained hands, he cried in horror. What happened, Rick? I pleaded for a response. I carefully stood up while holding my head. I looked at Rick, who was now crying in a fetal position. I slowly worked my way to the last stall and vomited when I saw what got Rick in shambles. There was blood splattered everywhere. Tim was decapitated. His head was floating inside the toilet bowl. I looked at Rick and choked when I got a good whiff of the strong iron scent. I didn't do it, Rick kept repeating. I backed away from him. From the corner of my eye, I caught a glimpse of the inside of the next cubicle. Sean was sitting on the toilet. He wasn't breathing. His skin was all blue, and he had dark marks on his neck, like fingerprints. His body fell over. I don't remember anything else after that because I blacked out again. I woke up sprawled on the bathroom floor. Next to me was Rick, whose bloody hands were in handcuffs. He was crying hysterically. The paramedics were in the process of moving Sean's bluish corpse out of the room. Students and teachers were outside the door trying to peek inside. The police closed off the crime scene with tape. The smell of blood still filled the air. I looked inside the stall again and could see Tim's head still in the toilet. Rick and I were escorted into a police car past the students. Their eyes were full of anger as they watched. They thought we were murderers. Halloween should have been fun, but it turned out to be the thing that would ruin my life and kill others. My friends and I decided to create a horror pop-up for the Halloween event. We used our creativity to make it thrilling and fun. We had no desire to harm anyone. 
We were a group of four outcasts who came together thanks to our love of all things horror. Well, two now. Tim and Sean are dead, while Rick and I are the prime suspects behind their tragic deaths. After our medical checkup, Rick and I were brought to a small interrogation room. We sat in awkward silence for an hour. I heard distant chatter and noticed a security camera hanging on the ceiling. After a while, I finally decided to ask him something. Rick, what happened? He was avoiding my eyes, and his whole body was shaking. He finally calmed down and was about to say something. Then the door opened. It was the lead investigator of our case. He introduced himself as Officer Wren. He sat in one of the empty chairs. He examined our faces, then focused on Rick. You were about to tell Emmy something. Start at the beginning, he commanded. Rick expressed his desire to go home. Then tell me the truth, so we can catch the culprit and set you free, the investigator said calmly. Rick was staring at the ceiling. I didn't kill Tim or Sean. I told them we had the worst idea for this Halloween pop-up. Your group converted the restroom into a horror booth and made it as realistic as possible, right? The investigator asked while taking notes. We were told to present something from Japanese culture or folklore. Rick pointed his finger at me. It was her stupid idea to summon the Akamanto. I wanted to do something more mainstream like the grudge. She was caught off guard. What is this Akamanto? The investigator interrupted. Her Halloween design was inspired by the Akamanto. It's a Japanese urban legend about a malicious spirit who appears to individuals using public or school restrooms. It is masked and dressed in a red cloak. Sean was wearing a red cloak. The investigator recalled. It was my idea to dress up and act out the legend. Anyone who entered the restroom was supposed to be asked if they preferred red or blue toilet paper after doing their business. I admitted. The police investigator narrowed his eyes. And in this legend, what happens if someone says blue? They will be strangled until they're suffocated and turn blue. Rick quickly answered. However, we decided to just spray blue paint on those who chose blue and red paint on those who chose red. The investigator tilted his head in confusion. So, Tim selected red toilet paper? We nodded simultaneously. Yes, and he was going to be sprayed in red paint so that it could look like blood, I said. Then Officer Wren sighed and lost his cool. Why was his head floating in the damn toilet then? Because he chose red. That means death by decapitation or a slit throat. Is this a joke to you? The investigator stood up. He was about to start lecturing us when his phone vibrated. Mm. And he received a message from his team about the legend of Akamanto. He sat down and read it silently. Then he murmured, What the heck is wrong with you two? A few days had passed and we didn't get much rest. The pop-up was supposed to be a redeeming moment for me to prove everyone wrong and regret ever belittling me, but it became too real. The spirit with a red cape actually appeared. We were back in the interrogation room. Rick started talking. Emmy tasked Sean and Tim to spray paint on anyone who used the bathroom. We removed the toilet paper from each stall, so when they had to wipe, they would be asked if they wanted red or blue toilet paper. While Emmy and I were both assigned to the entrance of the bathroom. He was right. I recall that two students came out of the restroom, smiling after having their hair sprayed with blue and red paint. Then minutes later, Sean came out and said Tim had a sudden stomach ache and was going number three. The smell was so strong that we had to temporarily close the bathroom. Sean had a stomach ache too after a few minutes. He tried to look for another bathroom, but it was too far away. He put on his mask to protect his nose and enter the bathroom. And that was the last time we saw him alive. We wondered why the two never came out. So I asked Rick to check on them. I heard Rick screaming, so I followed him to the restroom. I saw him trying to keep Tim's body intact. Then I saw a floating red cloak, so I tried to run away, but my head hit the stall and I passed out. Officer Wren slammed his fist on the table. I'm not here to listen to your bullshit. Two kids died and both of you are suspects. He pushed the table. Officer Wren escorted us to a cell and said he would ask us questions again later. I'm leaving you two for now. When I come back, 
both of you better tell me the truth. He started to walk away. He suddenly stopped and looked back at us. Get your story straight, or else you can kiss the rest of your youth goodbye. As soon as he left, the camera on the ceiling pointed towards us. This isn't our fault. We can figure this out. My uncle's a lawyer, I said softly. What? Akamanto was your idea. You have to take the blame, Rick yelled. I walked to the other side of the cell. Me? Take all the blame? What a jerk. It was at that moment that we heard the sound of a toilet flushing. Our eyes widened when we realized that there was a toilet behind us. We both stared at it. I could see the cold sweat dripping from Rick's face. The light flickered for a moment. We heard another flush, then another, and another. Whoever was controlling the toilet was clearly doing it on purpose, and then it stopped. We started backing away from the toilet. Rick screamed for help. He was shaking the bars, but it didn't budge. We braced ourselves for anything that would come out of the toilet, but nothing happened. Could it be that there was just an earthquake and it triggered the flush and messed with the lighting? That's probably what Rick was thinking, because he had a smile on his face as he started walking towards the toilet. What? Are you thinking that the Akamanta would follow us here? He started peeing. I smiled sheepishly. Then suddenly, a voice spoke from inside the toilet. What color cloak? Red or blue? The voice asked. Cloak? You said it only asks about toilet paper color. We knew that if he responded red, the Akamanto would slit his throat. If he answered blue, then the entity would grab his neck and suffocate him till he turned blue. The spirit in a red cloak came out of the toilet. Just choose one. You have to or else- Shut up! Let me think. Rick interrupted me. Okay, I choose blue. The Akamanto wrapped his hands around Rick's neck and started choking him. I could hear Rick gasping for air, and then dead silence. I knew I was next. After Rick's body collapsed to the ground, Akamanto turned to me. Now you, red or blue? I remained silent and just stared at it. After a few minutes, it disappeared. I forgot to mention... The only way to outsmart the Akamanto and have it leave you alone is to not respond. The sight was gruesome. Skeletons and mummified corpses were spread equally apart, hanging from the ceiling and twined in cobwebs. I nearly vomited at the sight. I knew that I would be next if I didn't leave, but I froze at the sight of thousands of spiders. I closed my eyes and opened them again, hoping that when I did, all of this would prove to be just a dream. That's when I heard the voice of a woman singing the most beautiful haunting melody. I went to Japan to finish writing my book a love story between a foreigner and a Japanese woman. Not knowing I would come across a different tragedy. The Izu Peninsula is well known for its beautiful coastlines and picturesque mountains. I made it to my Airbnb, a remote villa on a hill. I needed a quiet place to concentrate on the last chapters of my novel. As I waited for the host to welcome me, a gurgling sound from behind the house caught my attention. I walked towards it. For a moment, the dense, humid air made me feel as though I was choking. But then a sudden breeze filled my lungs as I walked towards a cliff. I found myself standing right next to a majestic waterfall. I was admiring it when an old lady greeted me. She turned out to be the host and mentioned that she was staying nearby with her daughter in case I needed anything. She handed me the keys to the guest house and walked away. The Airbnb was perfect and clean. Mats covered the floor and paper panels on the walls. After I unpacked my belongings, I decided to go for a quick swim in the water. On the way there, I noticed little spiders on the ground. 
They were crawling towards an abandoned house, not far away from where I was staying. I'm deathly afraid of spiders. The sight of it made me queasy. I tried my best to ignore the critters and went swimming. Although quite cold, the water was refreshing. When I got out, the heat from the sun warmed my skin. I laid down for a bit to dry off. I closed my eyes and ended up napping. I was awakened when I felt something bite my arm. I opened my eyes and saw a web-like string wrapped around it. Slowly, I was dragged into the water. I managed to free myself against some rocks and pull myself to safety. I looked at my arm and saw a red bump and passed out immediately after. When I woke up, a pretty woman was taking care of me. She introduced herself as Yumiko, the daughter of the old woman that I talked to earlier. She was alluring, seductive, and intriguing. Before I could introduce myself, she left, and her mother entered the room with a bowl of soup. I devoured all the contents of the bowl as I was famished. Her mother stepped out of the room, and Yumiko returned. I was careful not to make advances as Yumiko, despite her flirting, but I couldn't help it. The next few days were almost dreamlike. Yumiko and I had grown close. I was welcomed into their home, where I was served delicious local dishes. Afterwards, I'd feel drained but brushed it off as jet lag. I noticed that she never went into the same room as her mother. She would enter the room after her mother had left, maybe out of respect. But then my health slowly deteriorated. I was so confused but perhaps it was an allergic reaction. I vomited blood in the old woman's presence and for a second caught her smiling. I apologized and immediately went back to the Airbnb because I was creeped out. I was constantly uninspired and lethargic, so I decided to visit the nearest hospital. After some testing, the doctor informed me that my symptoms were those of poisoning, particularly caused by the venom of spiders. I instantly remembered the spiders from when I first arrived. So I decided to do more investigation as soon as I was discharged from the hospital. I brought a lighter, pocket knife, and a fountain pen for protection and if I was hit with inspiration. As I neared the abandoned house near the Airbnb, I noticed a small trail of spiders making its way through a small crack. I turned the doorknob and entered, and saw several men mummified in spider webs. Small spiders surrounded the room. I stepped on the victim's remains as the critters slowly crawled towards me. At the same time, I heard a woman's voice singing a beautiful tune. I was mesmerized, but my phobia of spiders overpowered my desire to follow the music. In my panicked state, I managed to set the room on fire with the lighter and run far away. As soon as the house burst into flames, I heard Yumiko's mother scream. The old woman saw me running away and cursed me. I ran back to the Airbnb and packed my things. As I was about to head out the door, I heard the melody from earlier. I was mesmerized. It was Yumiko singing. I thought of the spiders again, snapped out of it, and covered my ears. When I opened the door, I was shocked to see that grinning in front of me was Yumiko's upper body attached to long, hairy spider legs. I managed to squeeze past the half-woman, half-spider demon and run away. When I looked back, I saw that it was following me. I sprinted. Out of nowhere, Yumiko jumped in front of me. 
She grinned. She began producing blobs of silk, one after another, and aimed them at me. When she laughed, I realized she was attempting to ensnare me. She snarled and shot another blob towards me. It hit me right in the face. I was blinded by it. I fell to the floor face down, terrified. And just like any spider, she moved silently. I felt her hairy legs on my body and the spinning web around my legs. Then I felt a bite on my arm, followed by an immediate sharp pain. My shirt became damp as blood seeped out. Suddenly, I remembered the items in my pocket. I knew I didn't have much time. My hand was free, so I grabbed whatever I could and struck the beast with my pen. Her hairy legs tried to strangle me. I used the pocket knife to cut them off. The creature stepped back. She tried to flee, but collapsed to the ground. I pulled out my lighter, set her on fire, and ran into town. Ironic. I had neglected writing during this retreat, but my pen saved me. My nerves were still on edge as I entered the plane. I booked the first flight out of Japan. I tried to smile at the crew as they welcomed me to the plane, but I could tell that they could sense I was an anxious mess. I walked to my seat. I was relieved to have the whole row to myself. I sat down immediately, asked the flight attendant for a glass of wine, and chugged it. Soon, the plane took off. The captain announced that we were already cruising 20,000 feet above the ground. The wine hit me rather quickly since I had an empty stomach. I knocked out almost instantly. Then I awoke to the sound of screams. When I opened my eyes, I saw the flight attendant staring at me in shock. She didn't stop shrieking and pointing at me. I looked down. Hundreds of spiders were crawling out of the wound on my arm. Harper had been warned by her best friend, don't make unnecessary journeys and don't date strangers off the internet. Well, Harper didn't listen to any of that. She was spontaneous, she was impulsive, and she met the perfect guy on Tinder. Who knew a human's bite could be so dangerous? She had been dating him for a year now. He was the man of her dreams, the perfect gentleman. He was also a big foodie like her, always whining and dining her the way that she deserved. On that particular weekend, they wanted to keep things low key. Steve's family had a cabin up in the Smoky Mountains, and that was their favorite spot for staycations. She even packed a little surprise. She had the sense that this trip was going to be special. Who knows? Maybe he'll pop the question while they hiked. Everyone had told them to cancel their trip. But Steve was a seasoned hiker, and he knew the Smoky Mountains well. But something was different. An area that had seen a handful of disappearances in the last decade was suddenly seeing one every few weeks. First, they had heard on the news that two young tourists never made it to their checkpoint. A search party went out, but they were never found. Soon after, it was a man on his own taking a solo trip. All that was found by the search party was a single shoe with a little blood on the ground nearby. So, the general consensus was that he was eaten by a bear. People kept going missing. Men, women, children. It didn't seem to matter. Fewer and fewer people were willing to take the risk of venturing out there. Especially with all the conspiracy theories popping up online. It didn't help that the media had started digging up the story that started it all. Back in the 60s when little Dennis Martin had disappeared. He had been less than 15 feet from his parents when it happened. He was hiding, about to jump out and scare them. And then he was gone. 
No one ever found a trace of him, but some nearby campers reported seeing a disheveled man running through the woods, trying to hide from them like a wild thing, and speculation about what that meant had flushed the state. But that's why Harper's friends had started to make a fuss when she mentioned she was going to the mountains that weekend. She decided to go anyway. You know, for a romantic getaway. They arrived at the cabin, and Harper immediately made herself at home. They were there just a few weeks ago, so everything was right where she left them. While Steve was cooking, Harper put on one of her favorite horror movies, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and slipped into something more appropriate for the evening. Do I look good enough to eat? Steve had cooked a lovely steak dinner, and they were at the dining table, enjoying each other's company over a bottle of wine. So, what do you want to do this weekend? Jacuzzi? Hike? I'm fine doing anything, even just this. All of a sudden, there was a loud bang on the door. What was that? Harper asked, frightened. Probably a wolf. We are in the middle of nowhere after all. Don't mind it. Harper was concerned. She lost her appetite. The added sound effects of the movie's chainsaw and screams made her paranoid. Relax. Here, let me pour you another glass. Cheers to the weekend, my dear. Harper woke up groggy. When she opened her eyes, Steve was gone. She didn't remember falling asleep. She tried to move her body, but she was paralyzed and couldn't even utter a word. She lay there for what felt like an eternity, wondering what the hell happened. Maybe she drank too much. Maybe this was a game, but something kept dragging her back to reality. She didn't mean to dwell on the worst case scenario as she lay there helpless. She was drugged, but it was the only thing that made sense. Slowly, she could move her fingers and toes again. Then, she was able to roll off the bed and search the house. No one was there. So she started calling out Steve's name. No answer until she heard distant growls and glass shattering. She panicked, thinking the wolf got inside, and the door suddenly opened. Steve entered the room, shocked to see her up, and tried to calm her down. Harper, I'm sorry. I can't let you go. You'll run away and I need you. We need you. She was terrified. The words sounded hollow even in her own head. Everything felt wrong. I think it's about time you met my family. His family? Right now, it was all so bizarre. Then there was a strange smell. Harper sniffed the air as the smell got stronger and stronger by the second. It was the smell of sweat and rotting meat. She had just enough time to feel a tendril of fear wrap around her heart before she was coughing, <coughs> gagging on it. I was hoping it wouldn't come down to this. But my dad, he hasn't eaten in weeks. Taurus numbers are down, and you're all we have. In an instant, Steve grabbed her. The tranquilizer wasn't supposed to wear off for another few hours. I wanted to save you the pain. We just need an arm or a leg, and we can forget this ever happened. She was choking so hard, she barely noticed when the source of the stench revealed itself. Dad, not yet. She needs to be asleep. I don't want her to feel anything. Harper looked up and saw a man. Well, sort of. It was hunched over and dirty, dressed in scraps of rags. But that did nothing to disguise how big it was. If it had been standing tall, it would have been at least seven feet tall. And that wasn't mentioning the muscles that stood out all over its body. The stench continued to roll off of it in waves. The thing was standing a few feet away from her. Its only movement, the steady rise and fall of his chest as he panted, mouth slightly open. Harper felt herself freeze. She couldn't stop staring at the creature, and their eyes met. Harper could see the thing looking all over the room, nostrils flaring as it scented the air, and she suddenly felt very, very cold and even more exposed. As her heart started racing, stop looking at her like that. You promised you would only eat on my terms. The creature pounced towards Harper, but Steve got in the way. In an instant, the two were fighting. Harper watched as Steve's dad tackled him to the ground with superhuman strength. 
Then it bit his neck and started feasting. Harper wanted to puke, but she knew this was her only chance at survival. She managed to grab the tranquilizer and sneak out the room. She found the car keys, her purse, and made her exit. But as she grabbed the front door knob, she heard the dad. It was crying hysterically as it ran towards the door, its face drenched in blood. It looked right at her with pain and anger, and she knew she was its dessert. Another split second of hesitation went by as her body tremored. Then she exited out the door into the darkness. The sudden movement triggered the creature's predatory instinct to chase. So she flung her purse as hard as she could at the creature's face. It bought her a few seconds, making the thing stumble. But she only made it a few feet before she heard a feral howl behind her. Harper tried to tune out everything as she ran towards the car. She wasn't a track star, but it turned out that raw terror could be extremely motivating. She was so focused and almost at the car that she didn't even notice the tree stump until she was tripping over it. Her body twisted in midair, all that momentum being converted, and she hit the ground hard. A grunt escaped her, along with all of her air. And for a moment, she felt like she couldn't get her lungs to cooperate and fill back up. That moment was all the creature needed. It pounced on top of her, reaching out with strong, gnarled fingers, grabbing whatever it could, and putting all its weight on top of her. Harper's face was still pressed into the dirt, so she felt, rather than saw, as the monster got closer to her flesh, snarling and snapping, hot drool dripping down to her skin. Oh, no. She thought, I am not getting eaten, not happening. She managed to pull the tranquilizer out of her pocket and stab it. It yelped in pain, then opened its mouth and bit down on her arm. The thing's teeth were dull, like a normal human, so it took a massive amount of force for it to tear into Harper's arm, which was excruciatingly painful. Slowly, the creature was hit with drowsiness, and Harper was able to buck the thing off of her. She wasn't sure what she did. She just stirred and shifted from underneath the creature until she had enough leverage to shake loose from its grip and scramble to her feet. She stood up, breathing a sigh of relief when her arm was only seeping blood, not spurting it. She cast one more glance at the beast, which was fast asleep. Then she noticed the chainsaw next to the tree stump. In an instant, she grabbed the tool and turned it on. She cut off the creature's leg. Then Harper dropped it and ran to her car. Harper didn't stop driving, and she didn't turn until her feet were back on concrete and she was surrounded by the signs of civilization. Warning, this story contains excerpts of the forbidden poem Tomino's Hell. Listen at your own risk. The mysterious man slowly walked on stage. He introduced himself as Roku. While standing under the spotlight, he examined each member of the audience. And when he met my eyes, I felt uneasy. It was as if he was looking directly into my soul. I quickly broke eye contact. There were only a few people at the club. And we all shivered when Roku looked at us. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> Elder sister vomits blood. Younger sister's breathing fire, while sweet little Tomino just spits up the jewels. Roku was probably in his late forties. There was nothing spectacular about him at first glance. He was wearing a black turtleneck and gray blazer on top of it. His eyes were sunken in and sleepy. Overall, he was a decent looking man. Yet, I cannot stress this enough. I felt something eerie when he looked at me. I shook the feeling off and just listened to his performance. All alone does Tamino go falling into that hell. A hell of utter darkness, without even flowers. I took a sip of my third apple teeny, and I really had to pee. So I ran to the ladies' room. When I returned, the room felt darker and colder. Roku kept reciting his poem as if he were possessed, with each word louder than the next. For a moment, I thought I saw his eyes turn all white. I felt an evil presence in our midst. The more he recited the poem, the more I felt like we were going deeper into his trap. Not just on some empty whim, is flesh pierced with blood-red pins. They serve as hellish signposts for sweet little Tamino. 
I panicked and had the urge to run as fast as possible, but I felt stuck in a trance and couldn't move my feet. I saw several others fighting back tears and shaking in their seats, unable to flee. But eventually, he went silent. I was relieved when Roku finally finished his poem. The security guard immediately ran to the stage and escorted him off the premises. But the worst was yet to come. My name is Renee. I recently moved to a new city for a fresh start. I needed this change because I was really depressed. I found out that my husband cheated on me. I came to Seattle with only a backpack. I was ready to start a new life, but I wasn't prepared for it financially. That's why I was so happy when my college roommate offered to let me stay with her. Nancy was all brains and beauty. In college, we were inseparable, at least until both of us found boyfriends. When we did, we slowly drifted apart. She married early too, but the marriage ultimately didn't work out. Now she's the CEO of a startup and my lifesaver. On that evening, Nancy urged me to get ready because it was poetry night at the club downstairs. I thought we would have a quiet night in since it was storming outside, but as an extrovert, Nancy has to go out every Friday night. And as she likes to remind me, we're not getting any younger. I was in a great mood that evening. I made sure to put effort into my appearance. I was over my ex and open to the idea of flirting with a stranger. A security guard was standing in front of the main entrance as we arrived at the club. He checked our IDs and told us to enjoy the night. The club owner greeted us. We found an empty table and immediately noticed an older couple sitting at the table next to ours. The woman rolled her eyes when we sat down. Don't mind her, she's just being a Karen, Nancy whispered in my ear. Excuse me, are you talking about me? The stranger interrupted us. Oh no, we're not, I assured her and chuckled. We ordered drinks, an apple teeny for me and a Negroni for Nancy. So far, there was only one person who performed spoken word. Everyone was bored. I looked around the room. There were only a handful of guests and a man sitting at the corner of the room. It was pretty empty, which made sense. The storm was getting worse outside. We all just sat there in awkward silence waiting for the next performer. All of a sudden, the man got up from his seat and walked on stage. He introduced himself as Roku, cleared his throat, <clears> and recited the poem. When the audience snapped out of it, we were all scared shitless and eager to leave. What kind of poem was that? It sucked and was too scary. I don't trust that man one bit. I knew I should have stayed home. What a disappointing night. Food service sucks. These wings? Dry. And they never brought me my ranch. The woman took a bite of the chicken and swallowed it. Not long after, the anger on her face was replaced with a painful expression. Her face turned blue and she dropped to the floor. Her eyes were bulging out as she was gasping for air. Her husband screamed when he realized what was happening. Nancy and I tried to help her while the host called 911 but it didn't work. We were so horrified. A few minutes later, the host entered the club with the paramedics. They tried to resuscitate the woman, but she was already dead. Her husband was sobbing hysterically and went with them to the ambulance. Nancy and I headed back home, traumatized. When I sat on the couch, I noticed something was not right with Nancy. She was getting paler by the second. As I was trying to comfort her, she started convulsing, and her mouth was foaming. I was crying and dialing 911. They said it would take longer for help to arrive because they're short-staffed. My legs gave out as I collapsed to the floor next to Nancy. Nancy was already stiff and was no longer breathing. I probably lost my mind at this point. I just sat on the floor beside her body and just stared at it. When the paramedic arrived half an hour later, he pronounced her dead. As I grieved for the sudden loss, we noticed an odd smell in the air, and then smoke. The paramedic commanded me to run downstairs. He carried Nancy's body, and we headed outside. 
When we left the building, we were hit with a thick cloud of smoke. The club was on fire. The fire truck arrived shortly after. The heavy rain helped extinguish the flames. And unfortunately, the club owner's burnt body was wheeled out. It all felt like a nightmare. Or a living hell. I was asked if I had anywhere I could spend the night, and of course I didn't. He said they would help me find a hotel to stay at, until I could get my living situation sorted out. He told me to grab some of my belongings upstairs and meet him back here. When I entered the apartment, it felt so eerie knowing that Nancy was gone. Thinking about tomorrow and having to contact her family and friends made me break down. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. I mustered up enough energy to pack my backpack and said my goodbyes to the apartment. As I left the apartment, I was caught off guard. The mysterious man from the club was there, holding a knife. His eyes were completely white, and he was grinning from ear to ear. Now it's your turn. He jumped towards me, but I dodged in time. I started screaming as I ran down the stairs. And as he chased me, he recited the poem from earlier. Elder sister vomits blood, younger sisters breathing fire, while sweet little Tomino just spits up the jewels. I was right at the exit of the building when I tripped down a flight of stairs. I whimpered as his body stood over mine. I tried to get up. All alone, does Tomino go falling into that hell? A hell of utter darkness. Without even flowers. He stabbed me in the foot. I screamed in pain. Is Tamino's big sister the one who whips him? And then I heard a gunshot. And then another. I wiped the tears away from my eyes and saw the security guard from the club standing at the entrance of the building, holding a gun. The paramedic was right behind him. They carried me into the ambulance and drove me to the hospital. It was busy when we arrived due to all the injuries and deaths from the club. While waiting for a doctor, I learned that the woman, whose name is actually Karen, died from choking. Her husband died in a car accident along with everyone else who was in the ambulance. Nancy died of alcohol poisoning. The host died from the smoke. And I was almost murdered in cold blood. It was also confusing, but I had a feeling this was all because of Roku. It took me some time, but I finally found the name of the cursed poem he recited, and the legend of Tamino's Hell, and learned that anyone who hears or reads the poem in its entirety will die. Luckily, I didn't, but I'm still terrified that my time will soon come. Franz was a very naughty boy. But it wasn't always this way. Tantrums here, a little push there, then things escalated over the years. Fights here, murders there. He was raised by his Oma, a very sweet old lady, the kind that always carried caramels and lemon drops in her purse. But you see, his parents weren't nice people and got in trouble with the law, till they were caught thrown in jail, and executed for their crimes. Franz was still a toddler when he lost his parents, right before Christmas. Staring out the window, watching the snow fall to the ground, and realizing over time that they were never coming home. That he wasn't getting a train set on Christmas morning, like his father had promised. This changed him, the longing, the constant heartbreak of feeling abandoned, and something inside of him snapped. His Oma was shocked one morning when she found dead birds and mice under his bed. But what gave her a fright was seeing him play with the corpses as if they were toys. She immediately pried them out of his little hands and scolded him. Franz started screaming and crying. He didn't want to let go of his little friends. So, he bit his Oma, breaking flesh and giggling to himself in satisfaction. <laughs> At that moment, 
She knew he was indeed his father's son, an exact replica of the monster she had let into the world. Francis Oma worked hard to make enough money to buy him real toys for Christmas each year. She told him tales of the half-demon, half-goat Krampus in hopes of helping him choose good over evil. That Santa only gifted good children with toys. The bad kids all go to Krampus, who will kidnap and eat them. It worked. Franz didn't want to be eaten. All was well with the world. Franz was well behaved, and the two of them lived a happy life together. Until Franz started kindergarten. The children didn't like Franz. They found the boy creepy and off-putting. Something about him wasn't right. So they ignored him, and once again, Franz's biggest fears and insecurities came rolling back. The feeling of being alone. Peter, a boy twice his size, bullied him for being a scrawny little kid. He would call Franz weird and steal his snacks. As much as this angered Franz, he would let it go because he wanted to listen to his Oma and be a good kid for Santa. When Franz went home, he would cry to his Oma while telling her about the kids in school, how they all play together and leave him out, that it made him want to do bad things to them. But his Oma would immediately calm him down by reminding him about Santa and Krampus, that if he behaved and was a good student, Santa would give him a new race car for Christmas. But if he listened to that inner voice that told him to do bad things, Krampus would visit him instead, and his gift would be far worse than a lump of coal. Krampus would kidnap him during the night and take him away from her forever. And once again, it worked like a charm. Franz promised to try to be good. On the day before Christmas, Franz went to school, eager for the day to be over, so that he could unwrap presents and eat cookies. During playtime, Franz noticed that Peter was standing in front of his cubby and going through his bag. He was eating his snacks. Franz told Peter to stop and warned him about Krampus, that the demon doesn't like kids who steal, but the boy didn't listen. <laughs> Peter started laughing at Franz, saying that Krampus wasn't real, that it was a tale parents told their naughty children to get them to behave, but that there was no hope in Franz because he was rotten to the core, just like his dead parents, and that his Oma probably hated him for being so creepy. Franz started crying out of frustration, while Peter laughed at him and ate his cookies. So Franz pushed Peter to the floor and started stomping on him, and he wouldn't stop. Franz was sent home that afternoon and Peter to the hospital. His Oma, disappointed, told him to go to his room to think about what he did and said that he was grounded. Franz started screaming at her for lying to him about Krampus. He was so angry, he blacked out for a second and pushed his Oma. She fell to the ground and yelped when he raised his foot above her stomach, ready to stop. Luckily, Franz snapped out of it right away apologized and ran upstairs to his room. Franz did think about what happened. He felt betrayed by his Oma for lying, angry at himself for hurting her, and more alienated as ever. He always suspected that it was all made up, that she thought he was strange too, like the kids at school. Franz fell asleep, thinking Krampus wasn't going to pay him a visit. After all, he wasn't real, right? But in the middle of the night, he was woken up by a loud sound that made his ears hurt. Bells accompanied by heavy footsteps. Was it Santa? Was he a good kid after all? 
He opened his eyes and the room was pitch black. But he could hear chains scraping against the floor and a slight growl that made the hairs on his neck stand up. Varans quickly got out of bed and turned on the lights. And that's when he saw it. A huge hairy monster was standing inside his room. Franz lunged at the intruder, grabbing a hold of the giant sack it had on its back. The monster smacked him on the head with the bundle of birch branches it held, making the boy fly across the room and into the wall. Franz couldn't scream because he suddenly lost control of his body and was under some kind of trance. The devil before his eyes had horns so tall that they almost reached the ceiling. It was also covered in black fur and had cloven hooves. Franz tried to scream again for his Oma, but nothing came out. His voice had disappeared. The demon stared at him, its long tongue sticking out of its mouth, and around it were a set of bloody razor-sharp fangs. There was no doubt in his mind. It was Krampus. Franz froze at the sight of its demonic red eyes. The demon goat started walking towards him till it was just a few inches away from his face and could feel hot breath on his skin. Krampus analyzed him for a moment, then it growled, lifted up Franz and bit into his flesh. Naughty children are the most delicious, it said while licking its lips and took another bite. Krampus stuffed the rest of Franz into its sack. And with that, Krampus jumped out the window and into the snowy night. On Christmas morning, Franz's Oma prepared breakfast and laid out all of her grandson's presents. She called out his name, but he didn't answer or head downstairs, which was very unlike him. Franz was usually up bright and early on Christmas morn. She went upstairs to his room, but he wasn't there. Instead, shards from the broken window and blood were scattered all over the floor. No one knew what came of Franz. His disappearance was mysterious indeed. Many say he ran away from home. And many, like his sad but relieved Oma, say he was taken by the Christmas demon Krampus. Carried on its back down to the fiery pits of hell to be finally reunited with his parents. I hate dolls. I despise their faces, with frozen expressions and dead eyes that seem to watch your every move, but the fact that they're so human-like is what irks me the most. I wanted to explain to my daughter my deep hatred for dolls, and why she wasn't going to receive a new doll this Christmas. She reminded me of my younger self in many ways, a girly girl and stubborn as hell. When I was around her age, my parents and I traveled to Hokkaido, Japan, mainly for my dad's business. It was our first family vacation in a while and they bought me several toys, but one in particular caught my attention the moment I saw it. One day we visited a temple. We admired the statues, architecture, and its tranquility. But it was also the home of a haunted doll called Okiku. My father told us that a temple was a place of worship, which is exactly the feeling that overcame me as soon as I laid eyes on that doll. I needed it. I was sweating when we left the monastery. While the monks were praying, I grabbed it and slipped it inside my mother's backpack. It was my first time stealing anything, but I couldn't control myself. One second, I was just staring at the doll and the next, I was holding it. As soon as we got to our hotel, I took the doll out of my mother's backpack. 
They were shocked to see the doll and asked me why I stole it. My mother said that we should return it. I begged them not to take the doll away from me. My father convinced my mother that he would just pay for it. And moments later, he got off the phone. He said the monks refused the payment, and they said karma would bring the doll back to the temple. Nobody knew what that meant, but as far as I was concerned, I was happy because I could keep the doll. I gave my father a big hug and started playing with it. The beautiful doll looked very traditional in design, standing at about 16 inches, made of porcelain and dressed in a kimono with shoulder-length hair. Its jet black hair looked and felt just like mine. I spent most of the time brushing it. There was never a time that Okiko wasn't by my side. We also slept in the same bed, and that was the deepest sleep I've ever had. But one night, when my mother was turning off the lights in the room, I asked her to leave the lamplight on. That evening, I watched my first horror movie, Ringu, and I was creeped out. As she left the room, the light shined on Okiku's face. For a moment there, I thought I saw the doll grinning at me. I ignored it. I decided to just turn off the light and closed my eyes. I remember waking up around 3 a.m. and Okiku wasn't beside me. I was too lazy to stand up, so I just fell back asleep, thinking it was just a bad dream. I was relieved that the doll was in my bed when I woke up the following morning. Although, I noticed that something was different. Her hair had grown a few inches longer. Furthermore, the doll was damp. I double-checked my pajamas to make sure I hadn't wet the bed, but they were dry. The pillow the doll was on was wet as well. When I got up and looked for the source, I noticed that there was a trail of water coming from the bathroom. I was really confused. I got out of bed and checked the bathroom. I found my mom lying on the floor. I was worried as I thought she was dead, but it turned out she was just unconscious. She woke up and said she slipped and her head hit the ground. I was relieved to find out that my mother was okay. My father brought her to the hospital for a checkup due to some swelling. And Okiku and I were left alone in the hotel for a few hours. When my parents were away, I watched TV with the doll beside me. After a few minutes, the TV kept changing channels as if someone was pressing the remote repeatedly. Somehow, it kept going back to the creepy horror movie. I looked for the remote, and it was under Okiku. Her weight must have pressed the button, I thought, and then turned off the TV. But then, I overheard strange laughter in the room. I had no idea where it was coming from. The tiny laughter was terrifying, so I embraced Okiku, but realized it was coming from her. She smiled, showing off her porcelain baby teeth. I had never noticed her smile like that before. I dropped the doll and left the room as fast as I could. I waited in the hotel lobby for my parents. When they returned, they asked me why I was in the lobby, and I was hesitant to admit the strange things about Okiku. I was so scared of the doll that I asked my dad to hide it in my closet. I was surprised that he did so without question. I learned after the incident that my mom and dad were also suspicious of the doll. They also noticed her hair growing. Mom said that she also vaguely remembered seeing the doll in the bathroom before her accident. However, we were all shocked when it would show up in our bed, on the couch, all over the hotel room. My dad had enough and decided to bring it outside and put it in the dumpster. He didn't leave until he saw the garbage collected. We were all shocked when the doll reappeared on our couch again that night. We were all so scared that we decided to lock the doll inside one of the rooms while we slept together in the other room. My dad said that he would return the doll to the temple first thing in the morning. Not long after we fell asleep, I woke up to the sound of scratching outside our door. I woke up my mom who was beside me, but she was fast asleep and wouldn't wake up despite me shaking her. I looked at my dad on the other side of the bed, but he was snoring. Maybe the stress took a toll on them. I sat up and listened closely. That's when I heard the voice of a little girl calling me by my name and telling me to open the door. I got out of bed and walked towards the door. I looked at my parents once more. 
but as if in a trance. I kept walking until I was in front of it. Once more, I heard the voice tell me to open the door. I trembled at the thought, yet I was forced to follow. I raised my right arm toward the doorknob. I was hearing an evil laughter on the other side of the door, along with the continuous voice of the child telling me to do it. As I was about to turn the doorknob, a hand held my arm down. When I looked up, it was my father. He cursed whatever was ruining our family vacation and threatened to burn the Okiku doll if the haunting didn't stop. My dad's voice was loud enough to wake up my mom. She asked what was happening when the huge thump shocked us all. It was as if someone kicked our door from the other side. My father had enough. He took a pair of scissors. He opened the door, grabbed the doll, and cut off her hair, which was now at her knees. The doll screamed and tried to kick him, but to no avail. As soon as he did this, her body went limp. Since the sun was about to rise, we all headed back to the monastery. When the monks let us in, they took the Okiku, brushed her hair, and put her back in her shrine. My father was embarrassed and apologized for the misunderstanding. They quickly forgave him, and that's when we learned the history of the doll that it's actually named after its previous owner, a little girl from back in 1918. A young man purchased a doll for his little sister. She was obsessed with the doll and it never left her sight. Unfortunately, the little girl passed away a year later due to contracting yellow fever. While dying in bed and struggling to breathe, she held her doll extra tight for comfort. The girl was only three years old when she passed. The family wanted to bury the doll with the little girl, but couldn't. Over the years, the family noticed that the doll's hair grew, and slowly, they too were haunted by the doll. They believed their daughter's soul was trapped inside it. Eventually, they came to terms with it, but ended up moving. They didn't want the doll far from their daughter's grave, so they asked the temple if they could take care of it, and they happily took it under their wing, grooms her regularly, and even sent her hair for testing. And yes, her hair is real human hair. When I learned about this, I was so traumatized that when we returned home, I immediately threw all my dolls away and vowed to never have another one. But fast forward to now, my daughter of course doesn't understand. As she opened her present on Christmas morning, she was very disappointed to see I got her an iPad. She started crying immediately and said I was the worst mother ever. But just as she was throwing a fit on the floor, she spotted a wrapped up gift tucked away in the corner of the room. She ran to it, and I was confused. I hadn't noticed it before. She saw that it was for her and tore it open. She beamed with joy and started jumping up and down and laughing, <laughs> except her laugh sounded different or eerily familiar. When she pulled it out of the box, I started screaming. Okiku had returned. <laughs> this was the song that played on Dylan's little musical snow globe. It was a dark Christmas Eve. Dylan and his twin brother, Cole, were the only ones at home. Their parents went to the neighbor's house for the annual Christmas party and left them to fend for themselves. It was the first time. The twins insisted that they were old enough to stay home alone for a few hours and that they didn't need to hire a babysitter on Christmas Eve. So there they were, tucked into their parents' bed, waiting for Santa to arrive. Well, Cole had already fallen asleep. Dylan kept himself occupied by rewinding the snow globe and replaying his favorite Christmas carol over and over again and staring at the reindeer figurine, courtesy of their grandfather. The musical snow globe was an early Christmas present from his grandpa. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was the only song it played, but he loved it with all his heart. How could he not? After all, it was the last gift he received from his grandpa. The old man passed away earlier that month. He had cancer. Poor Dylan was heartbroken. 
but his tiny mind held on to the last words his grandpa said to him on his deathbed. Don't cry, champ. Otherwise, Santa will put you on his naughty list. Dylan turned his tear-stained face away from his brother, who was snoring next to him. He didn't care if Santa put him on his naughty list. He missed his grandpa and needed a good cry. Dylan sobbed quietly to himself when a loud thump disrupted his pity party. Something had landed on their rooftop, then slid down the side of the house. The loud thump woke Cole up. He sprung right up and shook Dylan. Did you hear that? Excitement pooled in his eyes and he scampered to his feet, pulling Dylan out of bed with him. Come on, it's Santa! He's finally here! Cole, wait! Dylan yelled. Unlike his twin, Dylan did not think the sound came from Santa Claus. Something wasn't quite right. There were no sleigh bells or ho-ho-hos. Frustrated by his brother's reluctance, Cole tugged on him again, but Dylan didn't budge. He remained rooted in his spot and kept shaking his head from side to side. Cole was about to cry. If Dylan didn't hurry up, Santa would leave and he wouldn't get to see him. Dylan, please, let's go. If we don't, he'll move on to the next house. Refusing to see his brother cry again, Dylan agreed, and they went towards where the noise came from, in the backyard. It wasn't the presence that made Cole want to see Santa. Unlike Dylan, Cole was unable to be in the room when he passed. He felt guilty about it, and had written a letter to Santa, asking for a chance to say goodbye and see him one last time. That was his Christmas wish. That is why he was so adamant about seeing the jolly old Saint Nick, but he would soon realize that some things are meant to be left alone. Finally, both of them got to the backyard, and that's where the problem started. There was no one there. Cole was scared now and started sweating profusely, even in single-digit temperature. Dylan, I think we need to leave now. He whispered, there's no one here. For the first time that night, Dylan agreed with Cole. He suspiciously looked around, and the stark darkness of the place scared him more than he wanted to admit. He nodded and started backing away slowly, but just as they got to the door that led back to the kitchen, they heard another sound. An animal growled from behind the trees. Now, the two of them started shaking. Who's there? Dylan called out. There was no answer. Outside, it was deathly silent and everything stood still. The wind stopped blowing and the leaves stopped rustling. The only sound that could be heard was the harsh breathing of Cole and Dylan. It remained that way for a while until suddenly, something popped out of the shadows. Both of them screamed. They wanted their mommy. A few seconds passed, and they finally stopped screaming. Their hearts pounded heavily in their chests. Cole was the first one to recover. He slowly pried his eyes open and stared in shock at what stood in front of him. Dylan couldn't move. He was frozen in place and too terrified to do anything. Dylan, look! Dylan had no choice but to look up and be brave. What he saw was not what he expected. There, standing majestically ahead of them, was a brown reindeer, and its face was glowing red. He stood beside Cole. Whoa! He exclaimed, starstruck by Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, his favorite Christmas character. Cole mirrored the same reaction on his face. They had only heard about reindeer, but they never saw one in real life until now. Then suddenly, like a magnet, they felt pulled towards it. Maybe Santa did arrive and was going to give them presents. With his energy renewed and hope restored, 
He tugged on Cole and ran towards the reindeer. He was too excited to see the animal. They came to a complete stop in front of it. They just stood there, staring at it in awe. They reached their small hands out to pet it. It felt like a dream. The friendly beast's fur was so soft and warm. Then Dylan began looking around. Where was Santa? He stopped petting the reindeer and went around it, in search of Santa and his sleigh. He checked the corner where the deer crawled out from, and then the front of the house. But it was far too dark for him to see anything. For some reason, all the Christmas lights had turned off. There was no Santa, no Dasher or Comet or Cupid, just darkness. Cole, can you come help me please? I can't see anything. He looked around some more, but it was useless. It was way too dark for him to see anything. He finally gave up and started walking back when he heard something he shouldn't have. Dylan looked up at their parents' bedroom window. That song was not supposed to be playing. No one was home. It was impossible for someone to wind up the musical snow globe. A scream came from the backyard. Cole! Dylan ran back to where he left his brother and the reindeer. He wished he never left him behind or left the house for that matter. But instead of a reindeer, another creature stood in its place. It had long, pointy antlers, the face of a deer, and the torso and legs of a human. It was now standing on its hind legs, staring at him, now with glowing red eyes instead of its nose. Dylan held his breath and didn't move a limb. It was as if the roles were reversed. He was now frozen in place like a deer in the headlights. And suddenly, the creature charged at him full speed, growling and with its red light beam headed straight at him. The adrenaline rush kicked in and Dylan sprinted towards the door, entered inside and bolted the door shut. When he was finally able to catch his breath, he remembered. Cole. Worried for his dear twin brother's life, Dylan looked out the window and saw the creature still standing there, staring and waiting for him. What kind of Christmas gift was this? Was he really that bad to have conjured up the demented version of the lovable reindeer? But thankfully, soon after, he heard their parents' car pull up to the garage. When he looked out the window again, the deer man had vanished. Their parents entered the kitchen very confused to see Dylan exasperated and unlocking the back door. Before they could utter a word and scold him for being up late, he ran outside to look for the creature. But it was long gone. And Cole? Dead on the snowy ground. <laughs>